my personal connection with Dr. Gore goes uh, back when I was a medical student, um, and he was a senior res uh, chief resident uh, in Cook County. And um, it was then that I got to know Rob, and we've had a connection for the past 11 years. And uh, although he was four years ahead of me, I always considered him as a role model, uh, someone who I wanted to, uh, to be like. And uh, it's great that now that we're colleagues, uh, both in emergency medicine, but also in this uh, field of equity and social justice, that we can work together on this project. So I want to say thank you for coming. Thank you for being our keynote speaker. And uh, I know you're about to wow the audience with, some, with an amazing presentation. So thank you for coming. Thank everyone for coming out this evening. Uh, I have my family uh, that's come up. Actually, everybody's kind of scattered around. Uh, they came up from New York City and some people who are here local. I'm seeing some of our former colleagues in Brooklyn who work with our violence intervention program. I'm seeing some mentors who are here in the audience that are based here in Boston. And I'm really excited to be here. You know, in, in my head, I'm thinking, Yana was up here at Harvard. And I'm like, wow, so you let me speak at Harvard. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm having fun with that. <laughs> In my head, you know, I'm like, nah, Rob, get, you know, get your game face on. This is some serious stuff. But I, I am excited to be here, especially with looking at long-term collaborations and partnerships, because there's a lot of stuff that's needed, that's needed to happen in our communities, both locally and globally. And it, all this stuff starts off with a simple conversation. Um, today, we're going to be talking about violence and its impact on our community. Now, many people have a close relationship with violence. It's where they live. It's what they do. For me, violence is around me all the time. Uh, I live in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, uh, so I see it when I go home in the community. I also work as an attending physician at Kings County Hospital in SUNY Downstate, which coincidentally is across the street from my elementary school, but we still see um, large amounts of violence in our community. So this is my work reality. Imagine you're at work. You have a 24-year-old male coming into the emergency department who's been shot multiple times. He was coming from an event, and his SUV was sprayed with bullets. As you can see, he's got gunshot wounds to the anterior chest on the right side. He also has through and through injuries to the right upper extremity. He's uncomfortable, but he's breathing OK. He's just in some pain. Mind you, he walked in the front of the emergency department. He drove himself there. We do a number of different diagnostic studies. He gets a CAT scan. He gets x-rays. He gets labs. He gets pain medication. He's there for about six to eight hours, and at the end of my shift, we wind up discharging him home because his injuries weren't fatal. He had no signs of any, he had no vascular injuries. But when you're talking with him, you also find out that he's been injured before, but he's on his way out of the hospital. So at this point, what do you do? Then you move over to the next room, and you can see this is a, uh, a GSW to the right hand. And you can take a look, it's a little bit blurry, but. That's because there are no bones left. This is a 19-year-old guy who came into our emergency department with a gunshot wound to the hand. We're not really sure if this was an, a regular assault, if this was just a, a robbery and he, uh, his hand got in the way, but he's injured. He gets evaluated by trauma surgery. He's evaluated by the emergency uh, staff members. He gets x-rays. He gets CAT scans. He's got some vascular injury, so he's going to have to go to the operating room with vascular surgery and orthopedic surgery. On your way out of the room, you notice that his family members and friends are standing right there. And a few of them say, we know who did this. We're going to get that mother. You know, and you guys know what, what adjectives we like to use and, and other, other uh, four-letter words and other interesting things to call people out. But you make eye contact with the family. They make eye contact with you. You know what they said. They know that you understood what they said, but yet you don't do anything. So this is a question that I have been battling with for a long period of time. I did my residency at Cook County Hospital in Chicago, and Chicago in the early 2000s is pretty much the same as Chicago right now, with violence on the rise uh, affecting populations of color. And your perspective changes when things become personal. And my family's from Chicago. My dad grew up on the west side of Chicago. I have a lot of cousins who live on the west side and the south side and the southwest suburbs and areas now what we call the wild hundreds, which because it's kind of wild down there. And some of them have been involved in street life. You know, we, we tended to have, we actually had different circumstances. And had I had some different circumstances, that might have, I might have had the same lifestyle that they've had. But I always wondered, would they come into my emergency department? I was also the same age range as a lot of the patients. And I was wondering, if it was the wrong day, the wrong time, 
would I also be that person who is the, uh, who's going to be, um, what do you call it, the victim of excitement? And so I started questioning myself. I started looking at violence and questioning why these things happen and really identifying the cause of the cause. And I thought it was more important, instead of just practicing trauma resuscitation skills, but looking at more creative ways to do violence intervention and prevent this stuff from happening in the first place. Now, sociologist Wade Noble said that power is the ability to define reality. Because you can't really talk about violence unless you start understanding this entire concept of power. But he said that power is the ability to define reality and have other people respond to your destinations as if it were their own. In South Africa, the old system of government known as apartheid, based on separation, segregation, and discrimination, where you had an exogenous minority group exercise and misappropriate and mismanage power solely to ensure economic, political, and social dominance over another group. Hip hop artist and entrepreneur Nas rapped, power. he's talking about power, and he said, it's that shit that moves crowds making every ghetto foul. I might have took your first child, scarred your life, crippled your style. I gave you power. I made you buck wild. Nas rapped these words when he was talking about the power that came from a gun. But power is kind of funny. You know, a lot of people fear power. Those in positions of power have a fear that power is going to be taken away from them. Those who aren't in positions of power have a fear that those in power are going to exercise that power on them for not having power in the first place. That's because power is control. Power is influence. Power is hierarchy. Power can be oppressive. Power can instill fear. But when power affects every aspect of your life, its presence or its absence can lead to conflict, and that conflict can result in violence. And violence is pretty common in the United States. It's depicted in films, as Martin, in Martin Scorsese's film, The Gangs of New York, where Irish immigrants and American Protestants, um, he was talking about gang wars in the early in the 19, in 1850s in New York City. It can rise because it can actually happen because of social and ethnic and economic disparities, which is part of the story behind the Bloods and the Crips and many other street gangs around the United States and in parts of Central America, and in South America, and in Canada, and in the UK, and in France. Economic disparities play a major role in this. It can affect young people who are going to school. It can affect party goers. Child mortality is highest in poor households. But the same, the same thing applies when you're looking at violence in our communities. This is actually a young woman who lost her child uh, due to violence in Philadelphia. You know, we say poverty kills. And let's just look at these poverty maps that we have. This is a poverty map. For, I apologize for people who were in the back and may not be able to see things as clearly. But this is a poverty map of New York City. This was taken from 2014. Darker shaded areas represent those, the per higher percentage of those living below the poverty line. The lighter the number, the more affluent the communities. I live here in the central Brooklyn area in Bed-Stuy. Most of our patients come from Bed-Stuy, Crown Heights, East New York, East Flatbush, and excuse me, these are actually represented by the, the darker shaded areas right over here. You also see you have a high concentration of people living below the poverty line in Newark, New Jersey. You see it in northern Manhattan, in Harlem, and Washington Heights. You also see it in the South Bronx. This is a New York City uh, Police Department homicide map. Again, the darker shaded areas represent the higher concentrations of homicide. Now, if we were to superimpose these two maps, there would be a substantial overlap. Again, homicides highest in poor communities. And because of that, sometimes people don't like to take it as seriously because it affects marginalized communities that don't have a say, don't have a voice. But it's not just New York City this, this happens in. You see it in Boston. You see it in Chicago. You see it in Oakland. You see it in Los Angeles. You see it in any other urban center and now some suburban centers, because, you, because of gentrification, where you have this massive shift of poor, um, poor people, or actually, you know, people living below the poverty line, I have to make, make a, a distinction with that, but people living below the poverty line who may not have access to substantial numbers of resources, and because of that, there's no opportunity, meaning you've got economic downfall leading to um, areas where you wind up having a rise in conflict. 
The good news is the number of homicides are actually lower than what we saw in the 80s and 90s. In the 80s and 90s, crack cocaine was a major epidemic, and we saw tons of young people, especially who look like us, who were coming in as victims and survivors of penetrating trauma. The good news is the number of non-fatal, the number of fatal injuries has decreased. But the bad news is. For every single homicide, there are at least 100 non-fatal injuries. And these injuries are just as debilitating. They cause both physical harm, physical disabilities, and mental disabilities. This is a patient we took care of in our, trauma, in our uh, emergency department. He had a razor blade injury to the left flank. We wound up going up to the operating room. We knew that he has what we call an evisceration injury, meaning his bowel contents are coming outside of his abdominal cavity, definitely not where they're supposed to be. But this individual goes to the operating room and he has a repair of the large intestine. But because of that, he's now got to wear a colostomy bag, OK? Think about this. You know what a colostomy bag is. A colostomy bag is a bag that you put on the outside of the body that's connected to the large intestine, which collects stool. Imagine you're a 17-year-old kid. This is not that patient. This is actually another young man who was shot by the police in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, because he was, apparently had seven grams of marijuana, which is not a whole lot but he was shot in the abdomen, and he was also shot in the spine, and now he's paralyzed because of this. But imagine you're 17 years old. You've had a gunshot wound to your abdomen, and you've been stabbed, and now you have to wear a colostomy bag. All of your stool contents are worn on the outside of your body. Imagine you're on a date, and these things leak all the time. The colostomy bag leaks. You've got this horrendous smell coming from you. Imagine the person you're trying to impress, what they're thinking. You're already embarrassed because you've been shot and you're limping, but now you smell bad. These things get infected, too. Now, let's say, for instance, you know, like this gentleman, he was shot in the back. Now he's a, now he's a paraplegic. He's, uh, he's riding around in a wheelchair. He needs someone to do everything, for, not do everything for him, but he can't walk stairs in the same capacity because he can't use his lower extremities. Um, because of that, he also has issues affecting his bladder. The nerve endings have been destroyed, and he has what they call a neurogenic bladder. So now he's got to put a tiny tube into his urethra, going to the bladder to drain the bladder. Because of this instrumentation process, you introduce bacteria into the urethra, into the bladder, and it can affect the entire uh, genital urinary system, leading to repeated infections. And some of these infections can be deadly. But imagine that. You're 17 years old. Now, let's say if you were a star athlete, basketball player, runner, football player, you lost your entire career, especially if you were good and you could have gotten an athletic scholarship. So now your economics has, um, has been jeopardized because you can't do the things that you used to do. But what if you didn't get shot in the belly? You just got sliced in the face. This is a young man I took care of who has what we call a smiley face injury, also known as a buck 50 scar. And the reason why we call this a buck 50 scar is because we, we guesstimate and say it takes about 150 sutures in order to close up that wound. Now, if you can see right here, and I apologize for some of the graphic nature of the, of the pictures, but again, we're, talking, we're trying to think about it. I want, I want people to personalize what's actually happening. When you're just looking at a number on a screen, you can remove yourself from it. You can distance yourself from it. But when you start to see the effects up close, it's very different. So if you can see right here, you have a, a laceration going all along the angle of the mandible. And this got repaired. He wound up doing well. The carotid artery is not that far. It's like right around here. The jugular vein isn't that far away. It's right here. If you cut the carotid, you cut the jugular, and they don't get, uh, they don't get intervention in a timely fashion, that person can die. You slice the trachea right here, that person can't breathe. That person can also die. But they didn't do that. They actually sliced him along the side of his face. You know why? Now he's marked for life. Everywhere he goes, people know what he had been through. And in some cases, he might have been a snitch. He might have done something that was offensive to another gang member. But he's marked for life. Now, violence is a costly thing. Violence can affect a lot of different things. And we're not even just talking about the medical aspects of care. But violence can affect communities and affect property values and cause property values to plummet. Uh, this is actually Newark, New Jersey. It can affect places like Gary, Indiana, and other areas that may have been a part of the Rust Belt, but because of economic decline, lack of job opportunities, people start fighting for resources. And when you, when you don't have the resource and when your basic needs aren't being taken care of, that's food, clothing, and shelter, and in some cases safety, you start fighting for whatever. And you start seeing high concentrations of violence. 
but it is costly. If you're going to have a patient coming into your emergency department looking at the direct costs of treating that injury for a hospitalized, non-fatal gunshot wound, whether it's a suicide attempt or um, a random assault, and combined with the lost wages and um, loss in productivity, that's about $23,000, actually between $23,000, $24,000, for that hospitalization period, which is a lot. And we're looking at a population where at least 70% are uninsured. Who's going to pay for this? And mind you, we're talking about something that's avoidable. Looking at direct costs of violence and the indirect costs of violence, when we talk about indirect costs of violence, we're talking about lost wages, loss in productivity, property values. Uh, we're talking about court cases, court fees. It's over $19.5 billion per year that the U.S. spends on dealing with these types of injuries, and it's avoidable. So we talk about violent being, violence being recurrent. Somebody comes and shot or stabbed, that re-injury rate is as high as 45% within five years of that initial injury. 45%. The homicide rate is as high as 20% at within five years after that initial injury. Any other disease process that had a 45% mental, uh, mortality within five years, it had been eradicated already. A 20% um, you know, re-injury rate for 45%, 20% homicide rate, it would have been eradicated. But again, you, people are looking at it because it's not affecting certain affluent populations. Um, but each subsequent injury increases that rate. So 20, it starts off 20%, may move to 40, may move to 50, and each injury keeps happening over and over again. I'm not sure if we, uh, I know Dr. Landry uh, is a physician and there are a couple other physicians in here, but some of the healthcare providers may have had experiences where you see repeat clients. They know your first name. They know your last name because you treated them the past week. I took care of a guy um, maybe about a year and a half, two years ago. He got hit by, no, he got hit by a car. And we're like, well, what happened? He's like, I don't know. Somebody just hit me. But then he came back two days later because he was stabbed in his back. Took care of him two days later. And I was like, you know what? I think this is a problem. And there's some other stuff that's going on that we need to start addressing. Now. Who's the face of violence? You know, what are the re-injury risk factors? Dr. John Rich, who used to be based here in Boston, is now in Philadelphia uh, running the Center for Nonviolence at Drexel, uh, had a paper and they were looking at re-injury risk factors amongst young black men. And there were a number of things that came up. Gang involvement, doing poorly in school, having easy access to weapons, or even just seeing violence using uh, both video games and seeing violence on TV. These are guns that were sold at the gun show. Um, depending on the state, you have different laws that affect gun sales, whether you're buying them from a federal federally licensed firearm dealer or you're buying them on the internet. Um, you often have different sets of laws. You have the Brady Law, which you, know, you have some states that have the Brady Law. You have other states that have laws that are very similar. But there isn't a lot of uniformity regarding these laws. And I know this is a big subject for debate, especially for people who believe in the right to bear arms. But this is a problem. You look at our firearm homicide rate in the United States, it's 17 times higher than the next top 25 industrialized nations in the world. But exposure to violence in the home is, is, is also one of the things that's very common and is a re-injury risk, fa re risk factor. Domestic violence, seeing violence in the household. I had a, I had a student that we've been working with and uh, used to do really well in school, but he had a lot of issues that were going on in the home environment. He was homeless, and his fa he and his family were living in a homeless shelter. Because he lived in one of the roughest neighborhoods in Brooklyn, he lived in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn, he became a gang member. He, he joined the Bloods gang, not because he wanted to, but because his survival was based off his, his ability to move to and from. And so he joined the Bloods gang at age 14. But he came to me, one of our program directors, Russell Frederick, um, after talking with one of the school social workers, and she said, you need to talk to him. And he said, Dr. Gore, he said, I don't know what to do. And it's like, what's going on? And he said, I'm mad, and I'm upset what's going on at home. He said, my stepdad beats my mom in the middle of the night in front of me and my little sisters. I'm having trouble sleeping. 
I want to hurt him. I want to call the police. But if I do that, then my sisters grow up in a household without a father just like I did. And this is a kid who's expected to do well in algebra, who's expected to pay attention in English class. And one of the teachers mentioned, wow, you know, he's just not doing well in school. He's just being lazy. No, this kid is tired. He's stressed. He's been beat down multiple times, and he doesn't know what to do because there aren't as many outlets as we'd like to believe. Mental health is a key component as it relates to re-injury risk factors. People who have pre-existing mental illness, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, oppositional defiant disorder, if they've been traumatized, all that does is lower the threshold that allows them to have an exacerbation. And sometimes, you know, especially you're already stressed out, we don't always make the best decisions. We don't always have the same coping mechanisms that are important for survivability. And because of that, we act out in situations, and depending on where you live in your neighborhood and you're set with, with laws uh, f followed in the street, that may lead to a higher rate of re-injury. Now, Dr. Rich also did a paper. He did a qualitative analysis looking at why young black men who were involved in violence in the first place, why do they, why do they get re-injured? Anyway, three key things that came up. The first was traumatic stress, also known as post-traumatic stress. 20% of young people who've been affected by major trauma, particularly violence, will still have uh, symptoms consistent with post-traumatic stress, much like what we see with our, our military recruits coming back from war. They'll still have that at least one year out. One year, 20% still have these symptoms. Between 30 and 40% will have symptoms at least three months after that initial, initial injury has taken place. And we're talking about people of color. We don't always seek out mental health services, partially because of the stigma, stigma attached to mental health services in many ethnic communities. Um, there's also the lack of availability. And so if you don't have those services available and there's a stigma, do you really think you're going to get that same amount of help that you need? No, it's not going to happen. Having a lack of faith in the police was another thing that was contributing to re-injury risk factors because they felt the need that they had to protect themselves. Flavor Flav, um, before he became like this reality TV show star, when he was back uh, rapping with the group Public Enemy, had a song called 911 is a Joke. And one of the lines is, they only come and they only come when they want them. So if you are already coming from a marginalized community uh, where that doesn't have the best relationships with law enforcement, do you really think they're going to serve in your best interest? No, you're going to make sure that you ensure your sense of safety and take matters into your own hands. And the last thing is having a loss of respect, which falls under the tenets of the code of the street. Philadelphia sociologist named Elijah Anderson with, has a book the same name, defined the code of the streets as a set of informal rules which govern interpersonal public behavior, particularly violence. So if someone attacks you verbally or physically, it's imperative that you respond aggressively. If you don't respond with aggression, it's viewed at as tolerating victimization, which sets you up for additional opportunities to be taken advantage of. I'm going to take you back to history class because this is a modern day reenactment of the ancient Mesopotamian code of Hammurabi, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth except this is still applicable in 2017. Now, looking at this convoluted diagram, you wanna, we, we know we have these risk factors, but violence is a cycle. Let's say, for instance, you, got a 20, you have a 19-year-old kid who gets injured. He has a gunshot wound. He's a treat and release patient, OK? Nobody's bothered to ask him, is he safe? Where is he going back to live? Because nobody, if they did that, they would have known that he's being discharged back to the same apartment building where the shooting took place. It took place in the lobby. Now, every day, he's got to walk through that same lobby. And the perpetrator is not in custody. Imagine what that would do to you. Imagine if this was something that happened every day of your life. Because this is not the first injury that you've had. You've been injured before. You've been jumped. Now. Medical, we're at Harvard Medical School, and what do medical students do? What do public health students do? What do a lot of graduate students do? What do parents do when, when the kids are finally out the house? They celebrate, and part of the celebration process is a self-medication for them. They drink, and they do all sorts of other things. I know med students binge drink, and residents definitely do it after their in-service examinations. Um, but this is a form of self-medication. Now imagine you have these traumas. And you don't seek out mental health, and so you're going to do whatever it is possible. You're going to self-medicate. You're going to drink. You're going to smoke. You're going to pop pills. 
But then, because you're on probation, you get drug screening. And if your drug test comes back positive for marijuana, you flunk your drug test, meaning you are already on probation, meaning you wind up going back in. So now you smoke synthetic marijuana, which is really crazy, and it's going to fry your brain in, in ways that I can't even imagine, can't even discuss right now, just because of the sake of time. But you lose your job, you drop out of school, and because you got to live. Because remember, your basic needs aren't being taken care of, food, clothing, and shelter, or at least those three things are put in jeopardy, you've got to fend for yourself. And so now you want, you, you've, got to, you've got to protect yourself because now you start to hustle, okay? Thus contributing to this cycle over and over again. You know, I grew up in Brooklyn. You know, I'm, I'm pretty thin right now, but I was pretty, I was extra skinny back then. And the first time I got jumped, I was 10 years old. Um, they, I got jumped, they stole my bus pass, they stole a dollar in my sock. Uh, in, in my back pocket, and it terrified me to the point that I started carrying razor blades and screwdrivers to school on and off between the ages of 10 and 18. I don't think I was a bad kid. My, my parents are here, so they might say something different, but, um, but I don't think I was a bad kid. I just wanted to be safe, and when you go from one bad neighborhood and have to pass through two or three bad neighborhoods just to get to your junior high school, you're always concerned about being safe. That's, again, that safety gets disrupted. Luckily, I never had to use any weapons. I got into fights, but I never had to pull out anything. But imagine if, that didn't ha if, that, if I did have to pull out something. This would be a very different story that we're having here right now. But a couple of people also get a chance to move away. Most people don't. You know, in New York City, you, if you're growing up, you have to take public transportation. So you always, you always have this threat of, is, is my kid going to be safe? But some people can avoid public transportation, and that helps allow them to be a little bit safer. Sometimes they can move away if the families have extra resources. You know, they may send, them, may send the kids back to the Caribbean. They may send them down south. Uh, my folks threatened to send me to a place called Piney Woods, uh, which is a, a black boarding school in the deep south where you work on a farm. I'm glad that didn't happen either. Um, but, you know, sometimes, you know, there's a concept known as lockdown where you have a kid, because there's a lot of violence in the neighborhood, they can't go outside. And so they watch everything uh, from a bird's eye view. They can watch out the sixth floor window watching everything that happens because there's a lot of stuff, dangerous stuff going on. But not everybody has those options. And so the cycle continues. The cycle can stop maybe if that person gets killed, but it doesn't really stop because their family members and their friends wind up coming in and getting involved. Mass shootings are something that has really changed the scope of violence because now the face of tra violent trauma aren't always black and brown youth. Now you're seeing mass casualty shootings affect people from more affluent communities. We saw it with the Orlando nightclub shooting. It was at a, a LGBTQ uh, nightclub, but you've got other people that are being affected by it. Look at Columbine High School. Those were middle class affluent kids that were being affected. The Sandy Hook shooting, middle class kids. In, uh, in, the, in the community in, uh, in, in, uh, up in uh, Connecticut. Now, as far as mass shootings, what classifies a mass shooting? You know, multiple people shot. There's a lot of subject for debate um, as far as what the actual definition is, and they're probably about three to five. But you've got multiple shootings. The uh, perpetrator doesn't have any direct relationship to the victims. Um, this stuff also happens in a somewhat public place, like a school. Now, we talked about re-injury risk factors as, you know, as far as John Rich's paper, um, but this is a paper that came out in 2000 looking at secondary school shootings around the U.S. And there were a couple of key things that came up. They were very similar to re-injury risk factors for young men of color. Doing poorly in school, easy access to weapons, poor social support system, gang involvement, exposure to violence, frequent fighting. These are the uh, perpetrators from the Columbine High School shooting. They called themselves the Trench Coat Mafia. They had access to automatic weapons, and they killed quite a number of students and teachers. But again, this is coming from all these, most of the people in this, involved in this study, those patients, the, the participants, or, or actually the perpetrators, they were coming from middle class and affluent communities. So as emergency physicians, and even as public health professionals, in some cases, we fail. Because we know exactly what to do in terms of treating physical wounds, but we don't pay attention to what actually causes people to come back. 
We don't think about the psychosocial support systems that need to be in place to make sure that this stuff doesn't come back. Somebody comes in, dry mouth, increased urinary frequency, overweight, we automatically check a blood sugar because we're thinking this is a new onset diabetes. But when you've got a 20-year-old kid who comes in shot or stabbed, if they're treated and released, we say, come back in seven days to follow up with trauma and stay out of trouble, knowing that that person may get re-injured in the first place. So there are a couple of things that are actually important in looking at the emergency department, even our hospitals, as not even just as sanctuaries, but as resources for patients who've been vi uh, victims and survivors of trauma. We're the first to see these inju injuries. Uh, we can provide resources. There's already a support system. And the hospitals, by the way, are considered to be a safe haven. So if somebody's running from someone, we may not want somebody running in and being chased around by someone who's yielding a weapon, but this is something that we can actually do. We can help provide a sense of safety. On a most basic level, it might even just be handing a piece of paper saying, this is a list of programs. These are some people that you can talk to in the community, making sure that you've got a support system. Now, there are a lot of different barriers to making sure, you know, to patients who've been victims of trauma or survivors of trauma because they do come back. Uh, a couple of key things came up by uh, Dr. Desmond Patton when he did a qualitative analysis in Chicago with, with uh, violence victims. These patients felt stigmatized. They came in, you know, you automatically come in as a gunshot wound, wound and people think that you're a criminal. We have uh, one of my uh, coworkers, he doesn't work at our a hospital right now, he's another EM physician. He was a resident and he was shot while he was at a club. He was brought to an emergency department. He was handcuffed to a stretcher. And he told them, he said, look, I'm not a criminal. I didn't do anything. I was at a club. I'm an ER resident at Kings County, SUNY Downstate. He's another man of color. And they said, yeah, right. He, I think he had some stuff to drink, too. Uh, so he might have been a little bit intoxicated. But he said, I'm an EM doc. Trust me. Let me give you my ID. And they didn't believe him for a while. So he stayed handcuffed to a stretcher for a long time until someone recognized him in the emergency department and said, oh, no, he's not lying. He's an actual ER doc. So you know, people feeling stigmatized just because of the color of their skin. Um, often EM docs and trauma docs don't talk, speak the same language as our patients. We speak in medical ease. We speak to the language that we would normally speak to our colleagues, to our patients. But if you're looking at reading levels, communication, language barriers, a lot of stuff doesn't get related in the same fashion that it needs to, which also leads people to come back. Issues obtaining pain medications, you know, giving someone Motrin, uh, because, you know, which is not really strong pain medication, and they actually have multiple injuries and fractures, and they should probably get some narcotics. This is an important thing that doesn't always happen with our clients. Um, having run-ins with the police, having problems with transportation. There's a young man that we're working with, 16 years old, multiple gunshot wounds. The incident took place not too far from the hospital, but he lives in Far Rockaway, Queens, which is probably about an hour and 15 minutes, hour and 30 minutes away issues getting to the hospital. And so the, a lot of the physicians said, wow, you know what? He just doesn't want to come. He's non-compliant, not realizing that this kid can't walk down train steps because he's got injuries to his legs. Not realizing that he, because he's been shot before and he walks with a limp he's, and he can't move fast, he's an easy target for other people to attack him. Because remember, it's survival of the fittest depending on where you live. And there's a concept known as trauma-informed care which is a very tailored approach to, it's actually a best practices approach to dealing with traumas. And it revolves around four key things. And, and with a key one, ensuring safety. So you've got safety, making sure there's the emotional management or, or psychosocial support, talking to them about loss and what to do in the event that they've actually lost either their ability to do the things that they, they used to do or in the event that there's a parent and they've lost a loved one. Thinking about the future, what's the next set of events? How do we get you, into, you know, additional psychosocial support? How do we get you a job? How do we get you back into school? How do we get back to a level of normalization like that you had before the incident took place in the first place? So hospital programs are important because they actually help decrease recidivism and prevent some of these violent injuries from recurring. Um, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about what I do. Um, about six years ago, we launched a hospital, community, and school-based program called CABI, which stands for the Kings Against Violence Initiative. So there are a couple of different components to CABI. For our hospital component, we work with people who've been shot and stabbed to ensure that they don't come back to the Department of Emergency Medicine uh, or come back to trauma because of the high rate of re-injury. And this is how it works. Someone comes in the ER, and it works very similar to the, what the VIAP program does here in Boston. The person gets shot or stabbed, our clerk, or the uh, triage nurse puts in a consult to the social worker. The social worker then contacts one of our, our team members, our hospital responders, 
or one of the uh, other community-based organizations also doing violence intervention work in Brooklyn. And we take calls on different day and have different tours uh, throughout the day. But those individuals are called. They talk with the patient, they talk to the families, they want to make sure that they at least get resources to make sure they don't come back. If the person winds up going into the operating room, can't really talk to them, but family members are up there. And remember we talked about before, retaliation can be very, very high, particularly when uh, you have a volatile situation. We talk about the golden hour of trauma, which is that first hour after a traumatic injury, where if you wind up intervening, can have major, a major impact on and outcomes and making sure there's a high level of survivability. But there's a second golden hour of trauma, which is looking at making sure we prevent retaliation from occurring. The earlier you provide those resources, the more likely the person uh, will have a sense of safety. We also follow those patients once they come out of the OR, we follow them up when they go home and we meet with them. They don't replace the social workers, they don't replace the case workers, they're there as an advocate, but you're dealing with people who know this business. They are credible messengers. Some may be gang members or ex-gang members, some might also be former incarcerees, but they speak the same language as the patients, which is important in relaying information, uh, as we talked about before, with barriers uh, once people get discharged from the hospital. We also have our school and community-based programs. We have over 200 kids in our school and community-based programs. For the school programs, we pull them out of class and we meet with them and we actually feed them. Our lunch is probably a lot better than what they call free-free, which is the free lunch that they give in the public schools in New York. Uh, they'd be like, mm, I'm hungry, I'll eat the free-free, but I'd much rather have the pizza uh, that you all are having. Um, but we feed them. We also do, do a series of workshops over a 33-week curriculum throughout the school year that focuses on mediation, conflict resolution, skill development, idea development. We also incorporate restorative justice practices, looking at cause of the cause, things like oppression, understanding power. Now we're, we're actually in a position where some of our former program participants are now teaching some of our workshops. So we've created a pipeline and you have the sense of graduated responsibility. We do the same thing in our community program, except we do that after school, and we do that with junior high school age kids. Actually, Dr. Irene Ahmed uh, was one of our former um, members of our team and helped coordinate and set up our tutorial program for our schools. Now, there are a number of different intervention programs out there. You've heard of scare tactic programs. You've heard of boot camps. There are a lot of gun buyback programs which are very, very popular. You've got these self-esteem programs, but they're completely useless because they don't prevent recidivism. And if you're starting to look, if you really want to change the scope of violence, you've got to make sure this stuff isn't happening in the first place. And when you have these isolated programs, there's not enough psychosocial support created in these. Programs that are very effective are programs that you know, are mentoring-based, programs that focus on family training, early childhood, or, or pre-parenting courses are very important. Programs that help enhance social and environmental factors, but really help uh, participants develop practical tangible skill sets that can be applied in a number of different scenarios, particularly amongst job training. If you don't remember anything else that we've talked about today, just think about the barriers. Think about the risk factors. When you have a young man, a young woman who's coming in, I, I speak about young men often, but we do have a, a lot of young women who are coming in and are injured, but we do have 80% young men who are coming in with penetrating trauma. But think about what brought them in the first place. Make sure they're safe. Make sure they have access to resources. If you don't know how to do this stuff, call somebody, Google somebody. Everybody's got Google on their phone. The good thing is today we have a number of representatives from the community that have access to resources that may be able to give to members of the audience that you can take back with you to your home institutions and whether they're educators with other health professionals. But there's a lot of continued research that needs to happen and even larger scale collaborative efforts and we're hoping that this this conversation that we're having here, having here today is the first of many different discussions which are not just going to focus on theoretical application, but really lead towards project and program development that's going to be transformative. And this concludes my presentation uh, this evening. And at this point, I'm going to entertain any questions from the audience. Hi, um, so I'm from Newark, New Jersey, um, and so I grew up in an environment that was uh, laden with violence. Um, and so it's very easy for me to find empathy um, 
with your story and with the story of the gentleman that you showed. Um, how would you suggest that we go about teaching our uh, colleagues from minor majority um, social groups the same level of empathy? How do you, you um, bridge that, that empathy gap? So there are first thing, a few things. Uh, one, I actually, this was my senior grand rounds prod, my senior grand rounds when I was at Cook County Hospital, uh, where I first started talking about youth violence. So I've been talking about this since 2005, 2006, and even for people who are coming, who work at Cook County Hospital, majority and minority, they're like, "What? Nobody's. This stuff is not going to change. Why are you even talking about this stuff to begin with?" Um, we don't say these same. We don't say this stuff when we have other illnesses that we already deem treatable. And so when you're dealing with any kind of health process, you're going to have to educate and educate some more and educate some more until you're blue in the face so people can actually start quoting what it is that you're saying. But it starts off with not just having it as you as the primary person. You know, it starts off as one person, then you start building a team dynamic, and then it starts to spread even long term. Um, there's a gentleman here that uh, we actually met. Uh, he's a student of public health. Uh, at Tufts, and we were talking about program development. What we're doing with the Kings Against Violence Initiative, we start off as a volunteer-based program. Uh, and I've been working on this, I've been doing community work probably since I was a kid. You know, when your mother's a teacher and your father's an activist and, and does, does uh, media stuff, this is what you do on, on your free time. Uh, but, you know, I've been, always been working with youth, and I've been lecturing about it and lecturing about it and lecturing about it and, apply, and talking to people about money and resources, and they were like, mm, great idea, sorry, there's no money. And it wasn't until 2011, after this program existed on paper for a number of years, that we said, the hell with it. We're going to do this stuff with no money. And we started building a volunteer-based model. We, had, we were primarily a volunteer-based model. We still have uh, quite a number of volunteers, but we were completely volunteer-based for two and a half years. This is no funding, just spending our own money out of pocket to buy pizza and food, because I figure you can convince a number of students to help join you and join your mission. We created Kavi using medical students, public health students, uh, community, lead, community activists, uh, teaching artists, because these are my friends. And you can rope your friends in a lot of different things. Uh, it may not be for long term, but at, le at least as an initial cohort. And then you start building it. But you've got to get a momentum, because no one invests in theoretical programming. And once you have a small prototype, it doesn't have to be a perfect prototype, but at least you have a platform that can be based in you can wind up building off of that platform. So it starts off with simple groups of education. I've had lectures with, you know, speaking to as many as 1,000 people. But the early ones, it was almost like two or three people. And so this is actually a huge audience based, you know, compared to like the old days. Thank you very much for your talk. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I work in New Orleans, love. <laughs> rates. <laughs> and one of the most difficult things we're faced with is how to link our community with maternity and service. Right. So I wonder what your program, how, how in the emergency room you are tied into the prison system. That's an excellent question because a lot of our patients uh, are former incarcerees, but we also have staff members that are on our team in addition to some of our other community-based organizations that we are partnering with who have many people who ha are former incarcerees. And because of that, uh, we have access to certain resources within the community. Um, I, I'm having a, uh, a brain fart for the actual organization. Um, based in, it's actually based in Queens. Uh, and they deal with a lot of uh, prison reentry uh, programming. But we wind up linking them up to those resources. If you have some, you know, the, your best advocate and the person who can do this work the best are people who've already gone through those experiences and that have risen above the situations. Um, it's a process. It's an extensive process because you're looking at making sure that their basic needs are met, making sure that they're also safe. You know, same thing with the self model, looking at trauma informed care, making sure they have the psychosocial support, which is a major deterring factor for why people go back in the first place. Um, I have a young man that. Um, actually worked with our team, and he's a former incarceree, was doing very well, but then had a number of other issues uh, going on in the home environment and started drinking a lot more. He stopped smoking weed, which is probably, a, which is actually probably better for him to smoke in the first place, but the alcohol has made him really crazy. I, I shouldn't say crazy, it made it, you know, it opened up a lot of other previous traumas. And 
he eventually wound up um, having a number of uh, mental breakdowns and wound up having to go back because he was considered to have violated his parole. Uh, but really creating a safety net, um, I, I really, uh, SOS, uh, which is with the Crown Heights Mediation Center in Brooklyn, has a lot of former incarcerees that work with their program. And they're plugged into the Center for Court Innovation, uh, which is a, also a major pipeline for hiring for some of these other organizations which can lead to you know, developing a sense of purpose, but also leading to a different level of economic stability so that you don't have to go back to the former street life. Oh, I see Dr. Reed and Dr. Landry. So my question was really about have you been able to bring any of this to the medical education setting in terms of the, the residency or training programs of the medical students. So it's not something you learn later, but you learn during those formative years of training? Right. That's an excellent question, and we're actually meeting with the deans of the medical school to talk about integrating this stuff early on in the curriculum. Uh, we're fortunate, you know, similar to Harvard, we, we definitely don't have Harvard's endowment, but uh, we have, there are a lot, a lot of resources at SUNY Downs State and at Kings County Hospital. We have a great school of public health, and a number of our early interns who provided a lot of free labor, well, I shouldn't say free, but it was an exchange for letters of recommendation, and they also had 200 hours worth of field work that they needed in order to graduate. Um, that was a major resource for us. And so these are early students coming to us early on as a part of the MPH training. We also did the same thing with social worker graduate students coming from SUNY Stony Brook. Um, I roped a lot of my medical students in. I, I, started, I launched a summer program called MMSEM, which stands for the Minority Medical Student Summer Emergency Medicine Fellowship. You know, there's a big acronym, you know, there's a lot. So we just call it MMSEM for short. And this was a program geared to increase the number of underrepresented minorities in the field of emergency medicine, but with a focus on project and program development. So they shadowed, but then they also wound up helping develop projects. The first project that they were tasked with in, two, in July of two, June of 2009, there were three young women, uh, medical students from around the United States, and they were with me and said, I had, these are my notes, these are my talks, this is what we know. We're going to help develop a, be a best practices approach to violence intervention and develop a program. And so we had medical students who were part of this pipeline program learning about project and program development early on. So it didn't happen like their third or fourth year. Once they become completely jaded and really just ready to get out of medical school or professional school, we got them on the tail end. And they were also part of the decision making process, which gives you know, young people who may not have a, uh, a fancy position on their CV, but now all of a sudden they're made a director of operations or they're made a director of, uh, of tutorial services and academic enrichment, uh, like Dr. Ahmed did. She actually ran our tutorial and academic enrichment program with another team of medical students for two years, and now she's a third year pediatric resident, uh, peds and, and psych resident here in Boston. And, so, and she's going to be continuing doing the same kind of work. So you wind up creating these pipelines early on, but the goal is to get them in the decision-making process and maybe even have it as a course. We lecture all the time at the School of Public Health and uh, in different schools of social work and do give seminars to medical students, but this needs to be an even larger integral part of the curriculum where community development is a part of what they do, not just something that they do once a, once a year. So understanding that you have home field advantage and that you practice, like you said, across the street from where you went to elementary school, how do physicians who may not necessarily be from a community um, get buy-in um, when they have an idea like this, when they have a project that they want to do? How do, they, how do you get buy-in and how can we, uh, who may you know, not be from those type of environments but have a vested interest in addressing these issues, how can we become more involved? That's another excellent question. Um, so I've been doing development work in Haiti. Uh, my dad has been down there and got me roped in. Uh, we also brought our, our emergency medicine residents involved and we've been helping uh, do emergency medicine systems development in the north and northeast part of the country. Um, helping teach drivers and laborers how to uh, do first aid and emergency response because there's no official EMS system. Now anytime you're coming from a community that you know may be a majority or minority but either way the community in which you're going into is not your own, you're already at a disadvantage and that's the perfect opportunity for you to figure out what the specific needs are of the community. You ask. Uh, before we started doing any major training in Haiti you know, you know we, we were there in 2009, started consulting in 2008, 2009 went down, 2010 spent five trips in ha went to Haiti five times that year before we even launched pro actual program. We did patient care, but we didn't do our large scale project until we built substantial community relationships. 
because you got to have buy-in. But when you leave that community, because if you're not from some place, there's a high likelihood that you might go someplace else, who's going to be left there? And so you have to have the community buy-in and not have it in this typical U.S. patriarchal kind of environment where we're going in and we know what's best for the natives and we're going to come save the natives. If that's what you, that's what your, your, uh, your motives are when you're coming into a situation, it's not going to wind up working or being effective. And so really looking at large-scale collaborations, figuring out what it is that you have. Maybe you have some special skill sets that you can offer once you've already assessed the problem, not necessarily assumed, but figuring out what kind of resources do the people that are already indigenous to that environment, the native people, what kind of resources do they have? What can they teach you? So you wind up having this cross-collaboration of resources and truly foster an educational exchange. So it's not your project, it's not just their project, but it's a collaborative project with the overall goal of making sure that that group winds up not needing you within a certain time frame. The goal of any educator to be, should be to become obsolete. If you're still doing the same exact work with the same community, with the same people, and nothing has changed, and they're still depending on your resources, then you've failed because you've not actually you haven't done anything related to capacity building and transforming and causing a lot, a high scale amount of uh, community development and empowerment. Um, hello, I'm um, going back to the curricular question. Um, you spoke about talking um, about violence prevention in the curriculum, but how much do we focus on the anti-racism and white privilege when we talk about um, violence prevention in health professional schools? Uh -huh. um, that's actually a great, a great question. We're talking about uh, discussing racism and systemic racism as a cause. Um, there's a book written by Franz Fanon. Franz Fanon um, was a physician, and his book, Wretched of the Earth, talked a lot about aggression, Repression. He has, a, he has a chapter specifically called On Violence. And uh, Franz Fanon was a physician from Martinique who, was, uh, who became a revolutionary. And a lot of his writings were influenced by his work in Algeria uh, during a time of civil war. And, but it really, he started exploring the cause of the cause. And you can't do violence intervention, particularly when you're dealing with a marginalized community who doesn't have access to resources, particularly when you see a sharp demarcation between the haves and the have-nots. And in the United States, it's typically uh, looking at one racial group compared to another. You have to address the issue of racism. When you start looking at violence and why people are acting on each other within the communities, a lot of times it's, it's a lot of aggression that's been repressed. And because you know, they, you're going to respond to who's ever around you. There's, a, there's a, a program in Philadelphia, and there's a common saying, hurt people hurt people. And in Phil well, Philadelphia, the program is called Healing Hurt People. But again, you've been marginalized, you're traumatized, you're going to attack the first person that's next to you, and it's typically somebody who looks like you, who you've actually had a prior relationship with. And so discussing the systemic causes, really, you know, even incorporating the mental health, and you and I spoke a little earlier about counseling, um, that's a huge thing because some people have so much repressed anger that they don't even know where it's coming from. It's like you know, their subconscious mind takes over their entire body you know, how, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, people talk about, oh, I got so mad, I blacked out, which I don't really like saying that because I'm black, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't, and, and there, there are other, you know, causes of that, you know, especially with, you know, using black and, and, and our color, you know, is, is, is something that's negative. But when you lose complete control, we've all done that at, at, at points in time. And a lot of times we wake up and we're like, wow, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. Why did I do that? And you go, oh, well, I'm, I don't know. And you just go back to doing that same thing over and over and over again because this is, this is your behavior because you haven't addressed the, the underlying psychosocial causes. You haven't, under, you haven't under, understood those repressed memories, and that stuff needs to be addressed. So talking about systemic racism, introducing counseling to understand not just that I'm mad, but understanding why I'm mad. A lot of the people that we work with, myself included, we've been in situations where we've been so mad and you've got two different emotions. You've got angry and you've got happy. And so if I'm not happy, then that must mean I'm angry. And historically, if you're angry, that means you have to respond phys with physical aggression. Not realizing that that stuff is, you know, happened because your family doesn't have a lot of money and you're tired of being poor and you're tired of being hungry. And you can see stuff that's going on on the other side of the tracks with people who have the haves and the have-nots because your, your grandmother um, you know, cleans up floors for affluent people 
in the, on the north side of Chicago, and she sees a lot of that stuff going on. She sees what kind of possibilities her family could have, but because you're black and you're poor, you don't have access to those resources. So that, there are a lot of things that need to be discussed. Technically, if you get a bunch of, we were talking a little bit earlier, if you get a group of people in together in one circle, technically that's group therapy. Um, if you call it group therapy and you st you're talking to many populations of color, we're going to run out because we don't go to therapy. We just go to church and we pray on it, not realizing that a lot of stuff, and stuff needs to be dis discussed with a professional who actually understands a lot of behavioral health uh, services, but with a cultural context. Thank you for this presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, over the last few years, there's been this emerging narrative about violence called cure violence, where violence is considered like an infectious disease. It's kind of like a medical take on violence, um, and that it can be contagious, right? If you're a victim of violence, people around you are more likely to be victims of violence, and so we should center interventions on groups of people instead of just that affected individual. But some people have pointed out that it can be a really problematic narrative about violence because then the solutions can be things like isolation or um, like separating ourselves from those people who have that contagious illness. Mm -hmm. What do you think the right narrative about violence is to be um, externally facing to people who maybe aren't in communities who face violence so that we don't continually reify this notion that it's mostly a black and brown people problem, um, but also maybe internally to communities that are affected where it really is a black and brown people problem. Um, excellent question, there are multiple answers to that. Uh, a few things, actually, I work with a number of the people from different cure violence groups. There are a number of other community-based organizations in Brooklyn and around the United States as well who operate using the cure violence model. They're separate programs, but they just use that particular model uh, to do violence intervention work out in the community and within the hospitals now. Um, and, and, and they are considered credible messengers. We have members of our team, for Kavi who came from Cure Violence. And so I know what they're capable of, and I, I respect them on, on so many different levels. The issue with violence and, you know, looking from internalizing it, separating people from it, and marginalizing people, and especially looking at violence as a disease process itself and almost looking like the whole thing like this is like contagion and really just kind of putting yourself in a silo. You know, Dr. Reed talked a little bit earlier about, you know, not having these silos and really opening up communication. Um, it can be detrimental, but at the same time, you, you know, your job initially is self-preservation. If you aren't at your best, how can you be at your best for other people? And there's a concept known as compassion fatigue, which often happens with people who are in the helping professions. Some people who've been dealing with traumas, and because they dealt with traumas in the past, they feel that they're, uh, and they're an expert in dealing with that, which is great because they have all sorts of areas of expertise, but the self-care component is left uh, to the side. And so the longevity in doing that work doesn't really happen because nobody addresses some of the other stuff. And when you're looking at violence intervention and prevention, I think our, our panel is going to have a lot to say on it. Uh, this is a, this is a multifactorial problem. Looking at medicine, you know, we have all these isolated specialties. You've got emergency medicine, you've got trauma, you've got OBGYN, you've got internal medicine, you've got pediatrics, you've got psychiatry. But, you know, your patient doesn't have these different compartments that they're all integrated. So you start looking at the problem itself from, and attacking it from a biopsychosocial model, really looking at a large scale integrated system on how these things can take place. But a lot of the work we're still experimenting on. You know, what happened, if you do violence, doing violence intervention work in the early, in the mid 80s and the late 90s is very different from doing it right now. We're, not, we're still dealing with, dealing with drug wars and turf wars, but now you've got Twitter beefs. And so you, now you've got all, the, all these beefs and all these conflicts which, which are arising because of, um, because of internet access and readily available to information and even having information overload. So now your treatment modalities and your intervention modalities may be very different now compared to what, was, what things were even five years ago when I started, you know, even more than five years ago when I started doing the work. There's a concept known as engineering design process, and I never knew what, what this was before, but physicians, you know, we were, we were great students, you know, public health students, you know, PhDs, we were like the top of our class, and we were, they, we were gunners. We're OCD, we're type A personalities, but because of that, we don't like to get things wrong. And we look at engine, our friends who are engineers who are just as smart, if, if not smarter than we were, they're like, look, I don't want to memorize all that stuff, but when we're going to do a project, you know, my goal is to get things as wrong as possible, as early on as possible, and experiment. And so what engineering design process does, and this is how our, many of our tech people think, 
a lot of our social entrepreneurs think and even our regular entrepreneurs think, uh, particularly our computer science people, you have a problem. You identify the problem that's at hand. Then you throw out a number of different ideas. You're going to brainstorm a bunch of different ideas. And you know, if I tell you to come up with one idea, there's a large chance that that idea might be really crappy. But if I tell you to come up with five different ideas, then you might have, chances are, maybe one or two of those ideas might be really good. And so you pick your best one, you test it out, and you, you implement it. But then because it's a cycle, you're going to go back over and figure out what did we do right, what did we do wrong. And this is a part of that process. So you're constantly making improvements to, the, to whatever, it is, whatever program that you're implementing, whatever project that you're implementing. And you look at, you know, why do we have over close to 14 iPhones? It's because they want to experiment as much as possible so they can get it right. Instead of just like, hmm, we got this one problem and just keep staying at it and staying at it and staying at it and not really making any major progress. And so we're still experimenting, we're still learning. Up until 20, it was in 2015 when money got released from the CDC in order to allow us to even, the CDC to give money for violence intervention stuff. Uh, I think it was sometime during the Bush administration, the younger Bush, where they diverted money, I forgot the name of the act, um, but they diverted money from violence intervention stuff and focused it specifically on traumatic brain injury. They weren't allowed to give money to violence intervention until 2050. I think they passed Obama. Uh, appealed in 2010 and it got approved in 2015. So there's a lot of experimentation. There's a lot of stuff that I shouldn't say experimentation. There, there's a lot of growth that needs to happen, and which is why we're continuing to do this work. All right. I want to say thank you to Dr. Gore for your excellent presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> um, in the interest of time, we're going to move on. I know there was more questions that were coming from the audience. Um, we have our panelists that are going to be here, and I think it will be also an opportunity for ask uh, uh, for, for more Q&A. Um, so next up, I want to bring up Dr. Rhea Boyd, who's going to introduce our panelists. Uh, Dr. Rhea Boyd uh, is uh, one of the Mange Commonwealth Fund Fellowship uh, Fellows, and she's going to introduce our panelists, and then we're going to jump into this next, next discussion. So Dr. Boyd. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce our panel today. Uh, we'll start with Deputy Superintendent Norma Ayala Leong. Thank you. She's an assistant chief in the Bureau of Investigative Services of the Boston Police Department and the commander of the Family Justice Group, which includes the Sexual Assault Unit, Domestic Violence Unit, Human Trafficking Unit, and Crimes Against Children Unit, as well as the Drug Control Unit, Special Investigations Unit, and a number of other investigative units within the BPD. Uh, a 35-year veteran of the Boston Police Department, Deputy Superintendent Ayala has worked in many investigative units throughout her career. She grew up in Dorchester and attended the Boston Public Schools. We welcome you, Deputy Superintendent. We also have Chaplain uh, Clementina Sherry. She is the founder and president and CEO of the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute here in Boston. The Peace Institute is a center of healing, teaching, and learning for families and communities impacted by murder, grief, trauma, and loss. Chaplain Sherry and her family founded the Peace Institute in 1994 after her 15-year-old son, Louis D. Brown, was murdered in the crossfire of a shootout. With over two decades of experience as a survivor serving families impacted by murder, Chaplain Sherry has developed best practices in the field of homicide response. She has extensive experience training public health professionals to better serve families impacted by murder and interrupting cycles of retaliatory violence. Chaplain Sherry and the Peace Institute were selected as 2016 <coughs> Social Innovators by the Social Innovation Forum in recognition of the Institute's groundbreaking solutions to social problems. Welcome, Chaplain Sherry. We also have uh, Rashawn Hall. There, yes. Uh, he is the director of the Racial Justice Program for the American Civil Liberties Union in Massachusetts. In this role, Mr. Hall develops, uh, helps develop the ACLU of Massachusetts' integrated advocacy approach to address racial justice issues. Through legislative advocacy, litigation, and community engagement, the program works on issues that deeply impact communities of color and historically disenfranchised communities. Prior to joining the ACLU of Massachusetts, Mr. Hall was a deputy director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Economic Justice, where his work included policy and leg legislative advocacy, community outreach, and he maintained a litigation caseload of voting rights, police, mi police misconduct, and public accommodation cases. He also served as an assistant district attorney for the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. A significant portion of his work in the DA's office included his time in the Safe Neighborhood Initiative and senior trial units where he prosecuted drug, gang, and homicide cases. Welcome. And finally, we have William Morales. 
He was appointed commissioner of Boston Centers for Youth and Families by Boston Mayor Marty J. Walsh in March of 2016. Commissioner Morales oversees BCYF's extensive assortment of programs and its network of 36 facilities, including 30 community centers located throughout the city. Previously, Commissioner Morales served as the executive director of the historic Boston YMCA, Achievers Branch of the YMCA of Greater Boston, and had oversight of uh, Eggleston Square Youth Teen Center. He oversaw the continued growth of both programs, which addressed the comprehensive needs of teens within Roxbury and surrounding communities. During his tenure at the YMCA, he was instrumental in, instrumental in advocating for older active adults, and he helped secure resources for the Roxbury YMCA Seniors on the Move program. A native of Roxbury, Commissioner Morales has a long-standing passion for serving the Boston youth community, founding the Youth and Police Partnership over 21 years ago. He won national awards as an emerging leader and is a recognized expert on youth development. Our moderator will again be Dr. Alden Landry, who was previously introduced by Dr. Joan Reed. In addition to his clinical interests and academic roles, Dr. Landry is co-founder and co-director of the Tour for Diversity in Medicine, which organizes biannual tours to colleges and universities across the U.S. to educate, inspire, and cultivate the future generation of minority physicians, dentists, and pharmacists. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. So as our panelists make it up here, um, I want to give um, both the panelists and our audience a few guidelines as we go into this uh, next portion. Um, so number one, um, I know we all have lots of questions and we want to be as engaged as possible. Um, but at, for the audience, if you have a question, try and keep uh, short so we can get to as many questions as possible. And try not to do that multi-tiered question uh, that we tend to do sometimes where it's there's an A, a B, and a C, where A and B are tied together, but C has nothing to do with A and B. So if you could avoid that, I would appreciate that. Secondly, for the panelists, I know you all have a ton of information. I want to make sure that we all have a chance to speak, so feel free to share the microphones and also share the questions. Um, so I want you all to notice that uh, w when we selected our panelists, um, we tried to make sure that they had ties to Boston, and there's a reason for that. Uh, Dr. Gore gave a great outline of violence, and he talked about it from a U.S. perspective, and then also talked about it specifically with what he was doing uh, in New York and specifically uh, in Brooklyn. Um, but we want to have this conversation about what's happening in our own backyard. Uh, we want to talk about what's happening in Boston, what's happening in the Boston metro area, and talk about solutions to violence as well as the root causes of violence. And so that's the whole purpose of this discussion going forward. Now, as always, uh, I'll tell you this. I had a prep conversation with the panelists. Um, uh, it was a brief phone call. And then, of course, I sent them a question saying, hey, this is sort of the framework that we're going to stick to. And out the gate, I'm probably going to change the floor, format of the questions and give you guys questions that I wasn't prepping you for. Um, and I think that it's based off of the conversation that we've already had with Dr. Gore and then also hearing some of the questions that are coming from our audience. So, I'm going to throw you guys a couple curveballs. But I think I first start off to, you know, we've, we've heard your bios and we heard what you do, um, but I'd love to hear why you do it. So uh, starting with Will, and if you could just give a short answer and we'll just go the line, down the line. Why, is, why are you interested in these issues when it comes, uh, specifically when it pertains to violence? And so I'll turn to you, Will, first. Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's because I, I'm, I've been a victim, a product. I've been surrounded around violence. Um, uh, grew up in a very, uh, home where my father was extremely violent and uh, expected that from both his boys. So if somebody had talked dirty to me or said something to me, my father would march me back outside and I needed to get into a fist fight with that, that young person. Um, at the age of eight, I'm a Brooklyn native from Williamsburg, South Side, <laughs> a Los Sures as we call it. Um, my uncle Chucho uh, was murdered in front of me. And, um, and all I can remember was being dragged um, from the scene, brought to the house, um, and my mother and my aunt being angry at me and telling me if the police come, don't say anything. And so I was hidden away from even being a witness, but there was no process on how I can have that conversation about what I just witnessed. And what I learned that day is that the world is very violent and that I needed to take a very violent approach if I felt conflict was coming my way. And so it was really easy to see that. Um, and that, you know, protruded um, our life and meant the move from New York from witnessing that to Boston. Um, and unfortunately, um, coming to a city where my mother knew no one, um, you know, we lacked resources. Uh, we were practically homeless because we rented rooms from individuals who lived in, 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 in housing developments. You know what I mean? We, we had no 
no housing stability. Uh, my mother was forced to make a call of putting me and my brother into the foster care system. And once I went into that system, I just graduated through every level of the system from DYS all the way to the time I was 17, going to prison. At the age of 20, I'm watching the news one night and I hear that a young man opened fires on two Boston police officers at the corner of School Street in Washington, which was my home neighborhood. And I remember celebrating that event. But then at four o'clock in the morning, I had two police, uh, two, excuse me, two correctional officers wake me up and told me to take an emergency call. And when I took that emergency call, um, I can hear the shouting and the screaming, but I could particularly, uh, uh, as they, the person was trying to find their way to my mother, and my mother took the receiver, I remember her screaming and shouting and saying in Spanish, que yo esperaba esto de ti. Mm -hmm. I expected this from you. I would find out that the young man had opened fire and was killed in a shootout with the two police officers would be my only younger brother. And so it became very important to me that, I, that there was an issue of trauma an issue, yes, poverty played, an issue the way the system had me ride through it, that somebody had to take a stand and make a change. And so I chose that in order to honor uh, the life that I was still given on this earth and to honor my own brother's life, that, that I wanted to live a little bit of it, making a change in regards to how young people are treated, but most importantly, that to make sure that I can become the individual that wasn't there for me. So that's been the importance of my work. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what brought me to the work, I think first as a, as a prosecutor, uh, was the reality that uh, I had privileges that a lot of people um, in my family and in the communities that I came from didn't have. You know? uh, and because of that, I avoided a lot of the, uh, the violence that a lot of people are experiencing. And so when I was in, law school, I, I found a particular calling in serving uh, black people, uh, specifically black people. And I, I saw that, you know, I was in law school at the time of the O.J. Simpson trial, and I saw Johnny Cochran, I was like, I'm going to be that dude. <laughs> um, and so that's how I began to fashion my career as an attorney, planning to go into public defense work and then become a criminal defense attorney. And uh, instead, um, when I was um, I went down to Miami for a year, was at the public defender's office there. Uh, then when I returned to Boston for uh, family reasons, I had an opportunity to work with the, the district attorney's office, uh, Ralph Martin, who was the DA at the time. Um, and it was a transformative experience because I felt like I had a particular role as a black man uh, within that role in the criminal justice system to represent the community, right? Because when I was talking to Ralph about taking that job, uh, I expressed some concern and some reservation about being a black man in a position sending other black men and Latino men uh, into the prison, into prison. And he said, I understand that, I completely understand that, but you also have to recognize that the, the victims of these crimes and the people who are traumatized by violence and crime in their community deserve to have representation that looks like them. And so uh, I, I, I served in that position for, for eight years, and I think it uh, was a very formative experience for me. Uh, I felt like I did some meaningful work and represented um, uh, the community, the Commonwealth, and served victims of crimes. But I also realized that there were larger systemic issues that my role as a prosecutor could not address. And to a certain extent, I was a, a part of, uh, of the problem and was not getting to uh, the solution. And so from there, I left and went to uh, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and now at uh, the ACLU, where I'm engaged in criminal law reform efforts as well as police accountability. Uh, efforts and it's because of that experience that I had uh, as a prosecutor, but also uh, uh, as my role as an ordained reverend in the the congregants that I serve, I see the reality uh, of the criminal justice system and the way that it plays out uh, in our communities, and so that's why I'm drawn uh, to this work. Thank you for the question. I say that I wasn't drawn, I was kicked in to do this work. And I always look at life before 1993 and after 1993. Um, I felt that I lived the American dream. My friends would call me an inner city wannabe suburban mom who looks like me and stays home um, in a society today. 
So I was a stay-at-home mom. My husband went to work. And I heard the violence was going on in my community, but I didn't, it didn't bother me because what I would hear next was they just came out of the Department of Youth Services. They just came out of prison. It was a drug deal gone bad. So for me, it was a sense of relief that would never happen to me because I'm not one of those people. And December 1993, five days before Christmas, is when I really woke up and I became one of those people. And when Lewis was killed, it was the question. We were the flavor of the month back in the early 90s. The violence in Boston was really um, high. And so we were that flavor of the month that the media wanted to know, was he in a gang? Was it a drug deal gone bad? Did he just come out of the Department of Youth Services? And I remember, for me, I couldn't get mad at them because just a few days before that, there was another Lewis Brown that was shot. And I remember saying, well, it couldn't be my son because he wasn't anything that the media portrayed. And then the question started coming to me. And again, I couldn't get mad at them because I was one of those people thinking that thinking what the media would say, people get what they deserve. Lewis wanted to be the nation's first black president. He had goals, dreams, and vision. And when the media realized that he wasn't gang involved, it wasn't a drug deal gone bad, then the statement started to come. We're sorry for your loss. Unfortunately, you know these things happen in this community. He was at the wrong place at the wrong time. And for me, that was my, that was my, I would say, my kind of tipping point that sent me to the next edge. And so the questions became, for me, I started to ask, well, if he was at the wrong place at the wrong time, at 3.15 in the afternoon, where are the street signs that says no walking, gang shoot at in progress? So I didn't want to focus on the fact that he was killed and how he was killed. I really wanted to change the narrative. And I wanted to really show that families in urban settings do raise young black male to have goals, dreams, and vision. So we wanted to teach the value of peace through literature and community service learning. Through that, Lewis's murder went unsolved for two and a half years. Lewis was killed by the son of a Boston police officer. For me, I needed to connect with that family. We were both from the community. I needed to meet that mother, I needed to meet that father, and I needed to know who could raise a child that could kill. When I met Doris, she was a mother just like me. And when we met at our Connor Blarney Stone, there were warm embrace and silent tears. And I realized that I didn't want to focus on guns, gangs, and give a black child a job. I really want to transform the way society responds to homicide. I really wanted to focus on the assets of our community. And I really wanted to teach the value of peace. So 24 years later, here I am, sitting at Harvard School of, where are we? <laughs> <laughs> you know, who could think that a, a, a black Latina woman from Honduras, Central America, could be sitting here, and again, through tragic, there is triumph. And I am here to tell my story, but I am here to also say we are more than that. And we are allies in this community. And we are, we are better than what the media portrays we are. That's what brings me to this work. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. And again, thank you for having me. Um, so I you know, grew up in, in Roxbury. Um, one of five daughters, very strict parents. Um, unlike you, I wasn't allowed to go out because there were things happening out there and, and I saw it and we were lucky to live on a fairly quiet street back, you know, back in the day. Everything happened on Dudley Street and Blue Hill Ave and all those other streets. And so um, I think for a long time, I thought everything was okay. Um, but then I, as I got a little older and had to take the bus to school, I realized it wasn't that safe. Um, and, I, and, and you know, my parents were, came here from Puerto Rico. I was born in Puerto Rico, but I grew up here, so I spoke the language. 
I was the one that had to take time off from school to take my parents to, you know, doctor's appointments and go to my other sister's parent-teacher meetings. So it was up to me to take time off from school and do all that. And so I started, I think I looked at just trying to find a job where I could help people that, that needed that type of help, like they didn't speak the language and, you know, they really couldn't get around themselves. Um, I think I got drawn, and, and for me, this has pretty much been the only job I've had. I was a correction officer for a year prior to, to uh, becoming a police officer, so this has been my one job. Um, and I took it again to, because I wanted to help people. And I, and I honestly believe that probably most people that take this job is because they want to help. The, you know, we all have those people that come on that probably have other, other um, ideas about what they're gonna do on the job, or they're only thinking about as they get up in, in grade, you know, take the exam, become a sergeant, whatever. But I think for the most part, when you talk to the young police officers, they want to make a difference and they want to help. Um, and I, I like to think that I, over, over the years that I have, um, I now in my position, I'm able to help the younger officers try to, I push them along, you know, especially Latinos, the blacks. I've worked in recruit investigations for a while. Try to get the department to become more diverse. Um, because I think the changes we're looking for have to start from the inside too. It's not just all of us, but it has to start from the from the inside out. And the and the only way to do that is to come in and join us and you know be a police officer and try to change the way the cult, culture is of the department because it is a, a culture. Um, so I, it's not as romantic or as you know, um, but. That's pretty much why, why I took the job. Great, thank you for that. So I, I guess the first question I'd ask, and I'll, I'll pose this to you, Will, uh, given um, where you're situated now, um, talking about the root causes of violence. And you know, as we look at, at, at Dr. Gore's presentation, we talked about the role of poverty. Uh, specifically, what do you, when you look at Boston and we see the hotbeds of violence uh, in our communities, um, uh, it, obviously poverty is, is up there. Uh, but what else is what else is causing uh, this level of violence in our communities, and what are some of the other issues that we need to be looking at when we try and address violence in our communities? Well, I think I mean you, you tap poverty, you talk that uh, sort of education, access to opportunities, access to relationships, real relationships, mentorships, and et cetera. Um, you know, but you know what I see a lot is a lot of young people also you know feeling a false sense of security. You know, um, you mentioned it earlier, the passage to get to school could be just a traumatic. Experience. I'm not going to go down Blue Hill Ave today because they're hanging there. So I need to cut through someone's backyard, jump a couple of fences so that I can come out on Quincy Street, and then hopefully hope that I don't bump into another group there can be another piece of uh, piece of it. But what I see in the experience that I work, you know, uh, the Boston Centers of Youth and Families are also um, the home for the Boston Street Workers Program and the Violence Interrupters uh, Program as well. And I know in conversations with, with my street workers, uh, many of them who have uh, either been caught involved themselves or gone through the system, you know, the one root underlying piece of it is, is, is uh, that a lot of us haven't really dealt with, our, with the trauma, you know what I mean, of, 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 of whatever has happened to us. And we haven't had those deep dive conversations. And so sometimes, you know, when you're struggling with something internal and there's no way of kind of letting it out, you know what I mean, the way you let it out, you know what I mean, it's not the way people uh, look at it very favorable. Um, in short, really, you know, trauma continues to be the embedded deep thing, I think, in our urban communities um, that actually equates that, you know, when, when someone is thinking of violence, you know, I mean, sometimes violence is, is the way we react to the pain that we don't understand. And so that's where I find that me and my team struggle with, trying to get people to understand where did it come from, where did it happen to, but how do you talk about it and get it out? And I think that that's the thing that we have to underline and, and, and have to begin to address because, um, you know, like me. I witnessed, I witnessed what I witnessed at eight, and that taught me that the world is violent, so I needed to become violent, you know? But I didn't realize that that was the root of why I got into this world of mess, why I became a statistical mess and not a success. Um, it took another form of tragedy to kind of wake me up to realize I need to first explore that, that origin and, and, then, and then struggle with the current tragedy and then think about what am I gonna do differently moving forward. And that's where it happened. Um, 
but I think trauma continues to be the underlying issue that we're still trying to understand and sometimes I mean, it's not easy to talk to, to individuals about. Razan, a similar question as, as someone who was a, a prosecutor and um, you know, you, you dealt with uh, you know, trying to put the, the, per the perpetrators behind bars. When you, when you look at why they were in that position, can you, can you talk about some of the things that you've noticed and um, you know, what fixes could have been in place before uh, so they wouldn't have ended up in that situation? Uh, I, I think part of how I understand it uh, now, um, nine years removed from being a prosecutor, um, is the, the operation and system of white supremacy and structural and institutional racism uh, and how that informs our understanding of our value. I think ta -Nehisi Coates uh, in his book really described this idea around the value of the black body and how little it is worth to so many. And so when I was a prosecutor, I would sit and look at autopsy photos of young men who were blown apart. Um, and I thought to myself, how could someone do this to another human being but for they did not value uh, that other person. And so when there is a system uh, that is consistently and persistently uh, informing the nation that you are less than, that you are not worth anything, that you are not valuable, you, it's, it's very difficult to overcome uh, and have feelings of empathy towards people and then you overlay that with uh, these concentrations of, of poverty and you, uh, Dr. Gore, you mentioned Fanon, you know, one of, I think, one of the more profound things that I found he talked about was this notion of internalized depression um, and that when you are cons um, constantly uh, put upon uh, and depressed that you then begin to internalize th that form of oppression and then uh, perpetrate it against uh, those who are closest to you. And so I think you know, that's the, the structural frame uh, that we need to, to begin to bring to this. I think we can tinker around the edges and, and um, uh, you know, do the, uh, you know, give kids jobs uh, type of programs, but until we begin to dismantle uh, that, we're not really going to get to the, the, the core and the root of it. Tina, it, I heard some amens coming from you and some head noddings going on <laughs> over there. I, I wasn't planning on coming to you with this question, uh, but uh, I'm happy to hear your thoughts as well. I mean, I think for me, again, you know, coming from a country, I didn't realize I was poor until I came to the United States of America. And, you know, Boston is very, it's deeply um, segregated. And where, when we only look at Dorchester, Roxbury, and Mattapan, where the problem happens, and I go back to, again, everything for me is 1993, that we know what the problem is. We know what the problem is, yet we consistently invest. We don't invest enough in the solution. 24 years later to say that the young people are the problem that were not even born when Lewis was killed. How can we, how can we expect for anything to change when we don't want to value families, communities, we don't value and we don't invest in primary prevention. We don't invest in what the research tells us. The Center for Disease Control talks about prevention happens at multiple levels. We have the answer, yet we're consistently waiting until the problem happens and then we consistently are, are blaming single mothers, are blaming poor people and are blaming the young people. So until we as a society or as a city see the basic value of dignity of the individual, the families, and the communities, this issue of violence will continue to happen because we're truly not investing in the basic dignity of communities. Great, well, thank you for that. Um, you know. Can you, uh, Will, can you talk a little bit about how we can start to invest in these communities with the work that you've done both at the Y and now with the mayor's office and what can we do to better invest in our communities and start to give back to our communities, well, not necessarily give back, to, to give into those communities that haven't been given back to. How can, we, how can we start this process? 
Well, I think that it has to be real community engagement that ha needs to happen. And, and, and what that means is that too many times, you know, we, some CBOs and some organizations come in understanding, understanding the issue and then, and then presenting what they think their solutions are. And then really then sometimes don't invite the community and the community voice into that process. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you mentioned it really clear, right? What's the purpose of us doing everything for them and then all of a sudden they can't do it for themselves? We, d we did nothing. So part of it is that when we invest in our communities, you know, I mean, if you looked at it from a financial standpoint, right, you know, we want to return back on your investment. So part of it is, is that we're going to invest, is that we're also going to invest on results. We, we, you know, we change the letters around a little bit. Um, and so I think that part of it is to really start saying that in that community there are real solutions that can be drawn upon, that can be brought to the table, and that they can take ownership of and then themselves, you know what I mean, really begin to basically answer what this issue of violence is. I mean, I was recently at a community meeting and the first thing that happened is that we've got them so accustomed for somebody else to give them the answers that people kept saying, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do about this issue of violence? What I do about violence is that I'm a father of five. Four of them are boys. The girl's the most violent one, but. <laughs> <laughs> Four of them are boys. What I do with them day in and day out will determine how they're gonna respond to certain I issues of conflict. So it, for me, it, it really starts at my home. Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if what I'm doing is right, but I'm sure that whatever I'm doing, if I share it with others, might be the, might, might be the opportunity to, uh, uh, to sort of change that, that aspect. So if we're gonna invest in community, we have to also allow the communities to also invest in our processes and help us figure this thing out together. Great. Norma, Sorry about the mic in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Norma, uh, just uh, thinking about the work that you do with the uh, Boston Police, you know, I know there's a lot of community outreach and a lot of efforts. Um, you know, what are the feelings that you're seeing from your perspective, uh, from the police perspective, and how they can be better engaged in the community? What you need from the community as a police officer to better serve the community? How can we start to improve these relationships? Because as Dr. Gore mentioned earlier, um, there's that 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 feeling of not only uh, mistrust in the police, but then also that uh, just the police aren't there for us and they aren't a part of our community. They just come in, they police us, and they and then they leave. And they're the, oftentimes seen as the oppressor. How can we how can we change that narrative? Well, I, I, I agree with, with Will, and I think Dr. Reed said it earlier that we can't work in silos. And I, you know, and, and it, it, it is frustrating for me because I, I do see it, you know, like the police will do something and then Will's group does something and someone else does something. I think we have to start really working together. But also, and I think Dr. Gore said it, like you go in, you, you're not gonna tell people what their problem is. What is the problem? And every neighborhood is different. You know, every neighborhood, you know, may have one area that's, that's a real problem. Or find out what the problem is and then work with the community and the, but the community also has to sort of take responsibility because that's their home. They live there, so they have to be willing to work with whether it's the police department or any other group coming in to say, okay, we're, we, wanna, we wanna make a change. I think that's where it starts. They need to wanna make a change and then kind of work it out, um, you know, again, if it's the police department, um, sit down, find out what the issues are, and then help them find solutions. Because I could sit there and say to you, this is what you have to do, but now I'm going home. And if you don't buy into that, then nothing's gonna change. So you really have to work with the community, find out what changes they, they look at, what they feel that they need, and help them with whatever programs we have that can help make those changes. Rosan, do you have any comments? Yeah, I, I, I do, I, and I think, you know, and I, and I had that same mentality when I was a, a, a prosecutor that, you know, the, the Safe Neighborhood Initiative that I was a part of, uh, we worked in uh, concert with community organizations to develop this um, uh, community priority list uh, with all of the community stakeholders and this notion that the community wants to have to um, that needs to want to have the change. Uh, and I, I, I take issue with that because I don't think there's any community that sits back and like, we like this. 
right? Or that this is okay to us. Everybody wants this change. They don't like the violence in their community. And I don't think that we need to continue to look to police and law enforcement for solution. I think if anybody uh, has read uh, Professor Elizabeth Hinton's book from the war on poverty uh, to the war on crime, the, the creation of mass incarceration, it's a fantastic examination of how uh, there was this shift in uh, poverty programming that was intended to be diversionary uh, and, and support the initiatives to provide young people jobs, to get young people off the street, to, to provide educational opportunities and workforce development. But instead, uh, instead of reinvesting in that uh, after the Johnson administration started uh, with the war on crime, uh, Nixon administration doubled down on the war uh, on crime, rather, instead of investing in the war on poverty and investing in these programs. So the number of police departments and uh, police officers doubled and tripled over the years, and that's where the funding was going. And then the police were being looked to for the solution to deal with societal issues and, and, and mental health issues. And I think that's the problem. It's like we need to rely less on the police. We actually need fewer police, right? That's, I think that's part of the problem. Everybody's going to say, well, what about all the gang members in the, tr in the, in the shootings? Look, if you invest the money, uh, in, in the community and in the resources and in educating our children and creating job opportunities and, and substance abuse treatment, we're not going to need them, right? And so I, I think that's part of the problem is how we look at what the solutions are. You know, as I hear your, your comment, I think about sort of what we do in medicine, whereas we invest all these dollars in coming up with new drugs and new treatment plans, right. but we don't necessarily address that, you know, if we help people with safer housing and we fix sidewalks and we uh, give people fresh food, fruits and vegetables to eat, they won't necessarily get sick and then require those new and advanced treatments and, 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 and medical technology. So it seems like we're always sort of putting the investments towards the back end and not necessarily towards the front end. Tina, do you wanna, do you wanna tackle this, talk about how we can do more to invest in the front end and uh, how we can do more to, to make sure that when, when we're you know, when there is a child that is out there who's out in the community and um, is looking for mentorship or looking for resources or looking for opportunities, what can we do to help those children who aren't in the cycle of violence but making sure that they don't even enter into that stream of violence? Well, I think, you know, it's going back. I've learned to like, re oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I've learned to like researchers um, because I realize what I've learned, and this is through Dr. Deborah Prothostitz, um, is we are used as communities for the better of publication, but yet the resources don't come back to the community. So learning and understanding violence as a public health issue, and it's time that we treat it this way, what happens is, and that's the first I heard through Dr. Stith, is now that public safety and criminal justice got defensive, because figuring out that if violence is now a public health issue, the dollars are gonna be taken away from public safety and, and, and criminal justice. So finding ways of, again, as a school, really, really helping to make the case that violence is a public health issue. So it's not taking money from public safety and it's not taking money from criminal justice, it's equitably investing money in primary prevention. If we give families, communities, children, basic dignity, the basic humanity, if we invest in what the researchers who have gotten millions of dollars to publish a publication, here is the answer. How do we begin to invest in the answer? Right now with the mayor's office, uh, uh, Division of Public Health, one of the things we're looking at is really working with the mayor's office and taking inventory on what is in this city, looking at it from a public health perspective. Who is doing the work in primary prevention? What do they need? And how do we make sure that we're not competing with government for the funding to make sure that the organizations that are working in primary prevention are really getting support to do the work. The same in secondary and tertiary. We, in 1994, we started teaching peace through literature and community service learning. First curriculum in this country that included the teaching of loss and grief as part of our children's social skills. Today they call it social emotional learning. 
Back in 1994, nobody wanted to talk. We were almost stopped from teaching the curriculum because whose values are you teaching? Whose values are you teaching? So now we can't even get into the school. We're struggling to get into the school. Why? Because our curriculum is not evaluated. We have not had a prestigious university to evaluate. So now programs are coming from across the country that are being done by academia, no disrespect. Um, but it's dismissing the work that's being done in the community. So when we begin to invest, truly, truly, truly invest, and to listen to what community needs. If my child wasn't murdered, I would not be here but I'm here because the city didn't know what to do with me. And so since they didn't know what to do with me, I figure out what I needed for myself and people like myself and people like my son and his friends. How do we invest in the basic dignity and humanity? So for me is again, researchers have been paid money and the answers are there. The answers are there. How do we get the academia to push and to say, let's now put the money where the work is being done and not always going at the back end and then blaming our children? I, I think um, the folks uh, who are a part of Harvard, Tufts, uh, BU, who are in this room should be hearing your call. Uh, because many of us are in academia and we sit in our ivory towers and we in our, we're in our office and we think about these things from a theoretical perspective. We know about the research that's out there, but we're not necessarily publishing the, uh, the results of, of interventions that we know are successful and how we can better engage with communities. So for any of those who are in this work and in this field, um, I think this is a, a call to action, not just to, to do the studies anymore, but start to do the publishings on, on the success uh, uh, and how we can be better invested in our communities. Um, with that, um, you know, as we, well, I actually I want to transition because there was something that you said earlier, Norma, uh, about the role of diversity in the police uh, workforce. Um, and, you know, we often talk about this in medicine and it's something that I'm, in, uh, I'm very passionate about in workforce diversity and in healthcare. And, you know, I, one of the com comments uh, or questions I have for Dr. Gore was along these lines, but, you know, can you talk more about how a diverse police workforce would actually be uh, helpful in starting to address police relationships with the community and what we can do more to um, have those better relationships when it comes to increasing the number of minorities, blacks and Latinos entering into the police workforce? Well, I think that, again, if you get people like us in, into these positions, you know, we, we grew, I grew up in the neighborhood. I, I know what my parents have gone through. I know what my, you know, extended family has gone through. and. I'm not gonna say I have the answer to everything because we are all different. Even though we live in the same community, we all have different needs. But if you have enough people from the community, you'll start to get an idea of what, what it's like. The problem, and, and, and I was in charge of the Recruit Investigations Unit, which is the, we hire the police officers. I'll be very honest, it's very difficult. And this is going back five, six years to get kids to take the exam since then and since the ferguson and since all these other um, problems that have come up it's almost impossible to get minority kids hispanics latinos african-american to take the exam what we have now actually is a lot of veterans and you'll get some uh, diversity within that but for the most part you're looking at white males <coughs> And so it's very difficult because we have to hire under a civil service exam. So we're, we have to follow certain rules in the hiring process. It was probably one of the most frustrating time um, for me, having officers go out into the community, to the colleges, high school, because you don't need a college degree, for at least for Boston, to try to get kids to sign up and take an exam. Um, we would have computers available for them if they didn't have them at home. We would have waivers that they could fill out so they wouldn't have to pay the, the entrance fee. Um, and even at that, it was the amount of people to take it was just very low. So 
if anyone knows the answer, I, I believe me, <laughs> um, I, I would be more than happy to listen. Um, it, it's probably one of the biggest problems we're having right now. So I want to prep the audience, and if you could start to prepare your questions, um, because I want to open up to you to be a part of this discussion. Um, and just while we're uh, getting microphones ready um, around the room, um, this is for all of you. Um, you know, we have a number of individuals in this in this room who may not necessarily be directly invested uh, in the Boston community. Some of us are uh, transplants that are here. Some of us uh, are here for for education uh, and may or may not have plans to stay in Boston. But how can we become more engaged in the community in these issues? How can we become more engaged uh, in addressing violence? So, if you have programs or opportunities for individuals. Uh, Norma, you just talked about people joining the police force, but is there other opportunities for people uh, who may not be heading down that road um, to be more engaged and to, to be a part of the solution? I, I mean, I think, you know, the medical field is, you see them when they come in, you see them at their worst. Um, I, and I, I applaud the program that you have, maybe having, you know, coming here and talking to our hospitals and getting similar type programs, again, to work together to try to help these kids that come in. Because as Will said, we see these kids, and I see them even younger and younger, out on the street when, when there's a, a shooting. And they're just standing there. And, and again, the parents take them in the house, and that's it. No one talks to them. No one finds out what they saw, how they feel. Trauma is probably one of the biggest issues we have with the young kids. Um, and, and again, it goes back to the the medical part. So if we can get some of the hospitals, you know, Boston City Hospital here, Brigham and Women, they get shooting victims. But to start to, to work with, with these patients before they send them back and somehow get the police, because we have to come out anytime there's a shooting victim or a stabbing victim, and work as a team as opposed to, you know, we do our job, they do, they're patching them up, sending them out, we're trying to get information, who did this, that sort of thing. You, you really have to do it and, and work together to, to help the community and, and, and the kids. Well, from a city perspective, how can academia be more engaged with what's happening in, in Boston? Well, I think um, part of it is maybe look at what we offer, I mean, and to really sort of assess, self-assess yourself. Do you want to do more of the prevention side or do you see an interest in maybe the intervention side? And then look at what we might have to offer and figure out where you may fit in that dynamic because you know everybody finds their calling in a certain way but i know that within the boston centers of youth and families you know we're unlike ymcas and trust me not mocking the why because i was there for 14 years okay and we're not like the boys and girls club a lot of the families that come to us come to us because really they have no resources at all and all our programs are either very low cost or no cost at all and so what that means is that you know our staff structure sometimes might be very limited. So opportunities to volunteer in a career-focused program or an entrepreneur program um, is great. To have somebody even talk to the kids about the opportunities of how I came as a person of color to think about this idea that I can become a doctor. Just having that conversation means a lot. Because a lot of our kids grow up already thinking that their world's four blocks. So sometimes it's good to have somebody come from a different part of the world or a different part or a different state and talk to them how they got here and what was that journey like to show them that they don't have to stay committed to four blocks. I grew up thinking my world was four blocks. I grew up thinking already that I was going to be incarcerated. And so if I ended up in a cell block and my brother ended up six feet under in a cement block, it's because there was a block mentality already established. Sometimes a, 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 an individual who comes in and shows them that there's a world of possibilities out there can become the blockbusters that we need in our centers to help rejuvenate and think about the way we do our programs. And sometimes it's good to have another set of eyes to look at what we do and how we're doing it and add a fresh approach. I know people are always resistant to change, but the reality is we have to be open to it because our children and what they're doing is changing. And we have to keep up the pace. And your support can kind of help that, guide that process along. I want to see if there's any questions from the audience. Uh, we'll go here. And then just to make it easy on you, we'll go here and then we'll come over on this side. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question for Mrs. Norma um, and Mrs. Tina and Mr. Rashawn. Um, but but they, they all 
they you all remember re- my guidelines. They, they're all they're you all the same. They all revolve around the same thing. Um, <laughs> they all revolve around the same thing, and it's trust. Because, like you had mentioned, even getting a diverse police force. Um, but growing up, we don't trust the police. So when it comes to recruiting um, more students or people to take the test to become police officers, what is being done um, initially to build that trust to say, okay, well maybe I can be a police officer, or maybe police officers are good people. Um, so what's being done in that regard? And, um, and then Ms. Tina, you had talked about the research. Um, of course, that's another thing that we've just grown up not to trust um, definitely in the black community what has been done um, in terms of medical, in terms of surveying a lot of black communities and then it just disappear and we don't know what happens. Um, so what's being done to even build that trust so we can accept the research? And then Mr. Rashawn, the same thing with lawyers. All we know is a lot, a lot of lawyers put people in jail. So in, in, terms of, in terms of in the black community, when we come in and we say we need more black lawyers and it's just like, well, all I know is lawyers are extremely expensive, um, and then they, they just put my cousin in jail. So what's being done to, to build trust in the communities? But before we address the panel, Derek, I'm gonna give you a pass on this one because you're okay. not on okay. <laughs> But for the rest of the audience, that is not how we're gonna go for the afternoon. But I'm gonna okay. let you pass because I've been working with you for the past six months, so okay. we're good, all right? <laughs> it's nice to see that he's been mentored well. <laughs> so, getting to your, how do, how do I, you know, what the police department is doing now, um, first of all, to, to, you know, when I sent officers out, when I was in recruit investigations, I had, you know, gay officers, Hispanic officers, black officers, white officers, and they went out, they did college fairs, they went to the schools, they went to neighborhoods. We, you know, I think we were doing it during um, one of the parades. We were in a parade with our banner, you know. So we trying to have people see people of, that look like them and talk to them about what the job is. Um, what we do now, besides, the, and that's the, like, the recruiting part, um, a lot of our officers that work in the gang unit, one day they're out there working in the gang unit, most of these officers constantly work with the youth um, in the schools, they play basketball with them, they try to mentor, I mean, you know, I, my drug officers, you know, I'll give them the night off because they want to go play basketball with some of the high school kids. So we're trying to do a lot of that. We do a lot of the peace walks during the summer um, with the clergy, the community residents. We have, believe it or not, Boston's the first one that has an ice cream truck. We go out in the summertime, uh, hoods, we give out the hoodsies. For those of you that don't know hoodsies, they're the little ice cream things. I know it's like a Boston thing. But we give them out and, and we'll park at a particular area um, we have the kids come out and always the parents come out and you know they get them too. So we just try to be out there to talk to people because that's the only way you get to know them. When I grew up and you know and the police went down my street, you didn't even look at them because you that was disrespectful. So we're trying to break those barriers and that it, I have no issues like I I walk out, you know, the kids wear my hat. I, I mean, I don't know honestly really what more I can do like to kind of try to make that connection with the kids. And, I, and I'm trying, to, you know, we talk about the young kids all the way up because you have to start with the young kids. Some of the older kids, you may not change those minds. But with the younger kids, if they can grow up and say, yeah, that's a police officer, but I also know them as, you know, the neighbor or, you know, their kids go to school with my kids or whatever, um, someone that, that they can approach. So I, I think those are some of the steps maybe small steps, but those are the steps that we're taking. Thank you. So that's an amazing question. I'm glad you gave him a pass. Um, <laughs> because if you hadn't, then he wouldn't have asked the three of us that question. For me, building trust, and again, I learned to build trust um, with academia through Dr. Deborah Prothostitz. Back in 1996, Deborah would travel 
the country, the world, talking about violence as a public health issue. And one year we met somewhere, I've always admired this woman when she used to, when she used to work at the hospitals and I would hear her story and one day I used to say, somehow I'm gonna meet that woman. I'm just, because I'm just so impressed a woman of color is really talking about issues um, that we care about, never knew that I would meet her when my son was killed. And what she did, as she traveled the country, she brought a lot of us together, survivors, and we formed the National Coalitions of Survivors for Violence Prevention, which our focus was, again, looking and allocating for funding for primary prevention. So working with Deborah is, was giving survivors a voice. I feel that Dr. Stith provided a space for me where I could scream, rant, and rave. And then she would look at me and then, so what you gonna do about it, Missy? And so for me, I felt that she provided an opportunity to hear, to look at academia, to, you can do your papers, but they really don't mean anything to me because you're getting rich off of my pain, but how do I take what you're researching and how do I bring it back from my community? So through her, what we did is we developed the P-Zone curriculum. Harvard got most of the money, but we developed the P-Zone curriculum that again was the first curriculum in this country from elementary to high school that incorporates the um, teaching of loss and grief uh, through our children. And there's information on the back that's there we can't, it, it's not, it's still there, you know, it's just there, so we can't get it into the schools because, you know, Harvard left and nobody wants it anymore. Um, so that was one of them. Secondly is working with UMass Memorial, UMass Boston, and UMass Medical that looking at mindfulness. Now survivors, trauma, and murder victims' families are the new in thing. Um, so for us is, if you're going to use me, how do I make sure that my community benefits, the survivor's community really benefits? So we work with UMass Medical and bringing in mindfulness, and mindfulness to work with families of murdered victims. And that was an eight-week course, and now the survivors of homicide victims have a tool that they can use with mindfulness. If it wasn't working with them, if I didn't learn to trust them, if I wasn't, can you tell I'm an introvert? But if I wasn't making noise, then again, or if I didn't learn to trust, I had to learn to trust. Because to them, it's goodwill that they're doing. I needed to realize, how do I also use you to make sure the community benefits? So when you leave, I have some tools in my hands. So that was UMass Medical. UMass Boston, even now, this burial guide is a step-by-step. -step. This is the first in the country. Um, UMass Boston, Dr. Professor Hartwell evaluated this with her students. So this is something that has been evaluated and our goal is that we're looking for universities to take this on and have this, teach this as part of School of Social Work in your, in your school because students have to come back into the community so now you're equipped with a tool. Our goal is working with the hospitals to really make sure that this is a tool that you can have in your hospital. Boston Medical, Beth Israel Deaconess and Brigham and Women Hospital have this tool now so when something happens Families do not leave empty-handed when their loved one are told that they've died in the operating table. So the trust goes both ways. I needed to let go and I needed to learn to trust. And trust people who look like me. And holding them accountable also. Because I remember with Deborah when something would happen and I would call her just really screaming, what are you brainiacs doing? You know, why is it that you, you can get all these research out there, but now it's time to really step up to the front and make the statement as to what your research says work, but you're not doing it. So that for me, the trust had to come from me. I had to learn to trust someone who looked like me. And then how do we become partners and how do we become allies for the betterment of our community? 
So uh, briefly, I think there are several initiatives within the, uh, the legal community to uh, establish trust, but also to diversify. Some of the things that are happening are uh, state and local bar associations have affinity bar groups. Uh, there's also, uh, they have a law day where they'll go into the schools um, and talk about a legal issue and engage young people to get them exposed early on. Um, I think another thing around the, the whole notion or concept of who lawyers are or what they do, um, a, a lot of people co of color come into contact with lawyers through legal services, either um, civil legal services or criminal defense, the public defender's office. And uh, usually ha there's a bad reputation around that, particularly as it relates to criminal defense attorneys or the public defender's office. Um, uh, but but the other part of the problem is, uh, is is cultural and how people can relate. And I think there are a dearth of lawyers of color uh, within the profession. And I think that you'll see that in a lot of professional uh, f fields because it's challenging for people to get into school. There are a whole host of barriers. Uh, and then the, the bar exam uh, is another thing that kind of thins out uh, the pool. And then when there are opportunities for people uh, to, to find employment, they're usually seeking the more uh, prestigious opportunities. It's very rare that you see people uh, choosing to go, people of color choosing to go uh, into the legal services field where there is the greatest uh, need for cultural, uh, not competency, but cultural proficiency. Um, so there's a, a long way to go, uh, a lot of work that needs to be done, but I think it's just in part, you know, folks like myself and other attorneys of color just being out there uh, and talking more about the work that we do and engaging more people, particularly young people. Hi, uh, thank you all for your comments. So there's, there's an emotional violence that comes when you are a person of color who grows up in the inner city and is constantly inundated with um, images of yourself being vi villainized, um, either through the media or either um, with how the criminal justice system interacts with people who are like you or who look like you. Um, and it's hard for me to buy that um, just diversifying the criminal justice system in terms of the prosecutors or the police force is enough to solve that emotional violence or even to really make a dent in it. Um, and the reason why I say that is because the um, gentleman who drove Freddie, Dre's, uh, Freddie Gray's joyride was an African American. The man who murdered Philando Castile was a Latino gentleman. Um, and so you have this sort of systems issue of violence and violence against black and brown people. And how can we move a step beyond diversifying our criminal justice system to actually have an impact on that systems issue? So if anybody follows me on Twitter, my pinned tweet is the image of this little black girl in a school photo giving the side eye and it says S is for side eye. And the, and the caption is when they're talking about diversity and inclusion and ain't said nothing about white supremacy or structural racism. And that's the issue, right? It's we're talking about diversifying and including people, but we're not talking about issues of equity or dismantling structural racism or white supremacy. And so and part of that is looking at the type of penalties and the type of policing that happens in communities of color. And so you can have, and though I think those examples that you pointed out get to the systemic issues that exist. And so how are we criminalizing communities? How are we criminalizing poverty? You know, the, the, and the, the whole notion of kind of fees and fines and the way that that continues to criminalize people and people end up serving time uh, because they can't pay their court fees. Right, and that's a further victimization, and that's firmer, further traumatization of, of already oppressed uh, communities. So I, I think that's a, a, a great um, uh, point, question that you raise, uh, and and I believe that the work is to deconstruct that, to one, to name it. Uh, and then figure out what are the drivers of it. And so for me, a lot of the advocacy that the ACLU involve, is involved is around uh, criminal law reform, you know, repealing mandatory minimum sentences, right? A police arrest data collection and the sharing of that data, police use of force data collection, police racial profiling data collection, because you can't manage what you don't measure. These are the things that kind of get to equity, equity, and start to deconstruct how white supremacy and structural racism manifest themselves within the criminal justice system. Tim, have any comments? No, yes. he said oh, perfect. It all. all right. <laughs> so, I, next question is going to be over here, Dr. Boyd. Thank you guys. I was wondering, a lot of you have talked about the need to kind of work together, especially you, Superintendent. Um, and I wondered if you could be more specific 
as it relates to the organizations that you work for on what that looks like and what the exact barriers are. Because like you said, uh, Chaplain Sherry, it's not as if we haven't known that we need to work together for a really long time. I think to your point, um, it's more that the structural issues are entrenched, that there are power dynamics that make the system work exactly the way it works now, that the way it works now is considered a success to some people and so what is the work, I guess, as it relates to your different organizations to switch that? Or does it look like a switch? What does it look like to actually, quote unquote, work together? Thank you for that question. So for me, I'm going to, and are we, be, are, we, are we being videotaped? Is this being videotaped? Oh, OK, never mind. So <laughs> never mind. No, I'll, I will say it, but I just won't name any names. So I'm going to speak from a woman of color, from a woman of color, that I'm on a 99-year plan to get a bachelor's in something, OK? We've worked for years to get universities to adopt us, to help us in publications and in research. Deborah came and left. UMass is there. We're still struggling. I, there are two organizations, sister organizations led by women of color, that two universities have to come on and publish the work that we are also asking to be published, printing, offering the resources. And I spoke to a young woman of color that I'm going to mentor now that came from one of those universities. And I said, why is it so hard? for me to get the support that my other two sister organizations got that are white. Why is it so hard for me to get that support? I didn't expect an answer for her. I knew the answer. I really knew the answer. And I think for me, here's what I'm looking for. Take us on research and evaluation. We've got work. I've created a model out of anything. The city of Boston began to refer families to us when a homicide happens because they did not know what to do. They didn't know what to do. We've developed a protocol, yet it hasn't been evaluated. Evaluate how we respond to families equitably and effectively. The young men that end up in the emergency rooms, when they end up dead, their families are left and are re-stigmatized, re-traumatized because the young man had a lengthy criminal record. Take us on and evaluate. And responding to homicide is not a sexy topic. But research tells us that, again, when we respond to families equitably and effectively, healing reconciliation and accountability can begin to happen and we will have the community that we want. So I'm saying partner with us or bring us on to do some training and technical assistance to the work that you are doing. We are really good. Help us to look at our model right now we are really trying, I am going crazy because I'm talking to everybody, I got to give them how much I charge I don't know how much I charge because I don't know what I'm worth. I don't get paid for what I do, but yet my white counterpart can get some money when they come and speak. So help us to package what we have. What we have. Use it as part of your students. Use it as part of your curriculum where your students need to learn this. That's developed by someone from within the community. So I, I'm good. I know that I'm good now because I'm sitting in front of you. <laughs> but how do we go beyond this evening coming here and how do we invest? Reverend Daly is here somewhere. So I'm hoping that after today that this conversation can begin to happen because I do, I, I like university people, I like smart people, I love researchers now because I know data. I've learned data. Now that I have data, I can sit with the big boys and I can tell them the data says if you invest in this, 
we will not have to be going in the back end. And then our young black and brown children can grow up to be their fullest potential. So I'm here and I'm eager, I'm eager to come back. I miss Deborah. I'm eager to come back. I spoke at Harvard, what was it, Harvard Divinity? And the same thing. Someone wants me to tell her my recipe for what? Dealing with anger? I've mastered dealing with anger. So I'm willing to give and to help anybody, but again, how do we make sure that once the research is published, I can continue to live life and my community is a better place? I uh, actually want to make a comment. Um, um, Chaplain Tina mentioned something about just sustainability and making sure you can kind of figure out what you're worth. Um, I struggle with that a long time too, and many organizations when you start off um, from a grassroots point of view, you, you have the mission, you've got the passion, but you wind up working yourself to the bone because you don't know how to say no. Um, and then you wind up burning yourself out because you suffer from compassion fatigue. <laughs> And, and many people in the public sector or any helping profession, physicians, public health professionals, educators, my mother's a teacher and she dealt with some, some, some tough knuckleheads uh, for a long time and I, I can see it on her face some days, but looking at the business model itself is exceptionally important. Uh, there's a branch of business which I, I found out from some friends who actually who do educational based entrepreneurship. Uh, one went to Harvard Business School, the other one went to, um, to Wharton we just happened to go to Morehouse together, so it's like, I'm struggling. They said, look, that's because you're looking at this as this humanitarian problem, and you've got to start looking at this from a business point of view. And there's a branch of business known as social entrepreneurship, which, you know, it is a, it's, it's a unique concept, I and mean, people have been doing it for years, but, you know, looking at what it is that you have, how do you create resources, how do you sustain those resources, how do you figure out what, what your product is? How do you market your product? How does that product have cross-pollination for other environments? How do you introduce that unique concept to other groups that may not have that same problem, but there's still an applicability for that? And a lot of times it doesn't happen at home. You've got to take the product elsewhere. Um, kind of like jazz musicians and, and even uh, a lot of artists, they, they can't make it home, so they got to go overseas. And then when, when people come back, they go, oh, wow, we always loved you. Actually, I just took that from uh, a hip hop album. I think that was Fonte uh, from Little Brother who made that quote. And, but you've got to really think about what the business is. And a lot of schools, um, Kavi, we launched grass, doing a, you know, we launched straight up grassroots style. I got sick of um, being told no for funding. And I said, hell, I'm going to start it with no money. And I'm going to take pictures. And I, I knew a little bit about marketing. I'd done marketing research. And my dad is an entrepreneur, and some of my friends were. I was like, I'm going to start taking pictures of what we do. Then I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to force the upper hand to make people invest in what we do. Then we're going to get access to the media, who's then going to um, put this stuff out there. And we actually shamed our hospital and, and the city to give us money because we were doing it with a volunteer-based program that was operating inside municipal-based institutions. But then um, we also had some, a number of different consultants come to us. In New York City, there's the New School, and the New School had a division of nonprofit development. They asked us to come and talk to them about what we were trying to do with Kavi. They didn't realize that we had launched the week before with no money, and they were like, well, how'd you do it? I'm like, we just did it. But they said, okay, you're starting from a grassroots point of view, and how are we going to, you know, how do you create this, uh, a greater level of sustainability? Because you can do this stuff for two years, you're young. But what happens when you hit 40 and, you, and your sleep cycle starts to change and you can't stay up for 16 hours you know, I, I, or, or 24 hours? I did that the other day, and so I don't recommend it because I'm still feeling the effects of it. But figuring out how you can bring consultants in who can give hardcore recommendations and help walk you through the steps to taking it from a, a grassroots organization with an amazing product to a sustainable and make it an actual business. And a lot of business schools will, will, de will use you as a case study. They will have consultants. They create their own consultant businesses. It might be a semester-long class project. We've done some stuff this past year with Columbia Teachers College and their School of Organizational Psychology, and in addition to the new school. And I'm looking to make some connects with some of the business schools that are out there because we need to come up with a product that can be sold and you can diversify your funding streams, which is another thing. Um, when you're only relying on funding coming from one source, and again, you can't learn this stuff from trial and error until you start paying people out of your pocket 
and you have and you start housing uh, your staff members on your couch because they can't pay their rent. Uh, they'll still do the work because they're your mentees, but it's like at the end of the day, they're looking at you because their basic needs aren't being met and they can't deal with their food, clothing, and shelter until you provide them with some resources. So, um, But diversifying your funding streams is important, particularly because some grants, particularly sometimes your, your federal money may not come as early as you'd like it to. And if you've already had a program that's up and running, you can jeopardize your entire project because you go through a month or two months without receiving any money. And your friends and family, they, they'll, they'll hook you up a little bit, but after a while, they just get sick of your butt. And, and it's like, okay, I can't do this anymore. And you want to burn your bridge. And then it takes, once you do get that money, you have, it takes a few months process to hire new people. So looking at private funding, looking at federal funding, looking at municipal funding, uh, looking at donations, which can uh, help, you act, you, help you develop a level of petty cash uh, in your account to pay for small things like food for an event or pay for somebody's college applications that is a smart kid, but they'll get discouraged if that money's not there and we don't want to just deal with this disappointment, you know, provide that disappointment because they've been dealing with it their whole lives and this kid has the potential to do something great. So you start figuring out how to make this stuff happen, but we have to stop looking at people that are within our circles and kind of expand these silos. I make it a point for the people on our team. I, I don't want people to think like me. Otherwise, you got a room full of ER docs with ADD and nothing can get accomplished. You got great ideas, but as far as long-term sustainability, that's not, that's not gonna be there. So reach out to the business schools. You've got a dynamic product and a lot of organizations, for-profits, non-profits, wish they had the level of longevity that you've had with the, with the depth of products that you have, but just reach out to them. Like, I'm a non-profit. We have this stuff going on and we're struggling to make ends meet and we need some help with program sustainability so you can turn us into a business model. They'll reach out. Can we get Harvard Business into the Harvard <laughs> Business School? Tina, I'll work with you. Thank you. Without a doubt. Um, I think I have time. I'm sorry, I know we have a bunch of questions. I'm gonna take one more question. Um, I'll take right here, this lady. Uh, yes, ma'am, um, if we could get you a microphone. I, before you get the microphone, don't do what Derek did, okay? <laughs> so you have one, please keep it short, a question, and for the panelists, if you can uh, have a short reply, if possible. Okay, question is more so for Norma. Um, I know that you had spoke about trying to level the playing field to recruit more officers of color. Um, and I absolutely appreciate the efforts in terms of diversifying the people that go out and try to engage with these individuals. Um, at the same time, I also heard a statement in terms of you have no problem interacting with the younger kids and then something seems to happen within that development that you're no longer connected when they become young adults or adults within the community. And so kind of looking at what's going on there. Um, and when the kids leave the schools and stuff, they come back to the community and they see that they're still white officers and the people that were there engaging and interacting with them don't look like them when they come back to their community. And so when we talk about um, leveling the playing field, are we also looking at what can we do to give students of color that might be interested in joining the academy a little bit more of an incentive, kind of, you know, a lot of times when you think about equality, we look at everybody's getting the same thing, we're not discriminating, but what are we doing to kind of level it a little bit more so that it's actually more directed to and catered to um, the people of color that are in the community and you know might want to make a difference but don't necessarily feel as if they have that same opportunity. So when I spoke about dealing with the little kids and the older ones, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it, we're trying to start with the little kids. I didn't say we're not dealing with the middle teens and stuff. Because like I said, we do have the officers that go out there. They, you know, they do different programs with them. But we, we are trying to start as young as we can because we I feel that you have to start that communication have that um, kind of rapport with them even as they're young so that as they get older you know they look at the police not not just because they're coming to the home when mommy and daddy are fighting which usually that's when they see us um, but you know they can talk to us as far as leveling the field Again, we fall under civil service. We have a residency uh, rule that we, 
you know, have to follow. So anyone taking the exam has to have been a resident a year prior to the exam. Again, we hope and would hope that that would give us more of the local people to take the exam. But we're just not getting the numbers. And, and, and like I said earlier, if anyone has a, a, a good idea, I'm all, you know, I'm open to, to trying to figure out how do we get out there, how do we get the message out uh, to the kids and the young adults that we, you know, I personally, I want you to make changes from in, within the department because you ha that's, that's one way to make changes to how we have officers out there interacting with the public in the community. Um, what we do though is uh, the kids that are in the, the academy that come in as recruit officers, uh, Superintendent Lisa Holmes, who's been, she's been on the job like 32, 33 years. Uh, she runs the academy, has run it now for three years. She has made unbelievable changes since she took over. And, and one of the big things is these kids spend as much time out in the community as she can get them. I mean, obviously they have to do their, you know, they have to do certain classwork and there's certain hours that they have to do. But these people volunteer at night and on the weekends and they go out, they'll do the ice cream truck, they'll do, you know, they'll do a, a run walk in a certain neighborhood. Um, they meet with all different, and I don't know if you're asked to go in, but I think that's a, talking to, we'll talk to Lisa about that. <laughs> but we have people come in from the neighborhoods, from the community, to talk to them from, from you know, all sorts of different, um, whether it's uh, mental illness, homelessness, human trafficking, gun violence, whatever it is, whoever we can get in there to speak to these recruits so that regardless of who they are or where they grew up, and again, these are all people that are from the city, but you know, when I, when I went, when I came out of the police academy, I was assigned to walk in Brighton. I had no idea Brighton was part of Boston because I grew up in Dorchester and Roxbury. So that's why we try to get everyone in so that the kids that come from the West Roxbury, the Brightons, the Charlestown, they, get to learn what it's like to live in some of these other communities. All right, I want to say thank you to our panelists, and I want to say thank you to our keynote speaker. I completely acknowledge that there are still a lot of unaddressed items on the table, but the hour is uh, late, and this is a long conversation, and obviously there needs to be more follow-up to this discussion. And so we will do our best to continue this discussion so that this isn't something that we do one time as a feel-good opportunity and then don't have any follow-up. So please be assured that there will be more coming from this, uh, from our office and from our efforts uh, with the Equity and Social Justice uh, Committee. Uh, there is another presentation that's going to be happening uh, on Monday uh, with the Harvard Kennedy School on prisons and jails, America's newest uh, mental health hospitals. That's going to be... Um, next week and that's uh, again another way to continue this discussion um, for our panelists you've been um, amazingly candid and we appreciate your honesty with your discussion points um, we will have a reception outside um, so if you want to continue this discussion a little bit further we can do so um, but again i want to say thank you to all who came and i want to say thank you to our panelists for being here and uh, let's keep this work going because we have to address these issues in our community so thank you